one. From the PM messages I'm getting, I think this demo is going to be the long-awaited revision of controlling the paint. Now, what I want to do this time is add to everything I had there, show some things in a different way, but then also add all of the features that Rebel 5 and Rebel 5 Pro add to Rebel 4. But also, I'm going to break it down in chapters. So then if you want to go back to it and just get a little refresher on one particular tool or one particular effect or technique, you can. However, if you want to sit through the entire uh, video demo itself, then you'll get a pretty good uh, idea of what makes Rebel tick. I don't think there's anything better whatsoever when it comes to traditional watercolors and how the colors actually mix. But we'll go over some of those things too. And just to discuss the brushes, the techniques, water, and all the tools that you have to work with, including some layering. Now, let's get started because we have a lot to go over. Chapter 1, Color and Pigments. We will get started on that chapter here shortly, but I need to get involved in a little bit of background information that will apply to this entire demo. And that is how you perceive color. Now, if you're just doing this as relaxation or you're just doing it uh, to get started and colors may not be that critical, then that's fine. That's all you have to worry about. You don't need to go any further. But if you want to take your colors more serious, then you may have to start talking about the calibration of your monitor. Now, I come out of a professional photography background also, so the calibration of my monitors were very critical. And the reason why is it will look for a white point, neutral white point setting that I need because when I photographed weddings, yes, all the dresses are white, but some have a very subtle blue sheen to them and others have a very subtle gold sheen to them, depending on what materials they were made from and how they reflect light. I needed those subtle colors to be able to come out in the photographs. So with that said, what I would do is calibrate it. And this is the one I use right here. It's just the older color monkey system I have. Now it's I1 Studio from X-Rite, which is pretty much the same thing. But the difference when you calibrate is it will take in consideration your ambient light, which in another words, if you're working in a room with a lot of windows, then your light may vary from night to day. And if you're working under the same conditions, that's great, but sometimes you always don't have that option. So what it'll do is it'll calibrate your monitor system for what ambient light you have, providing you work in those same conditions all the time. It'll also measure the amount of light being reflected off of your monitor. So in other words, different monitors are made from different materials and, and reflect light in a different amount. So if I have lights behind me, or especially even light colored objects behind me, that object might subtly reflect off my monitor and, and really affect how I perceive colors being viewed off of that monitor. So that's not the same as just downloading an ICC profile and running with it. That is not taking in consideration your ambient light and your reflected light. Now, with all that said, uh, what I want to do here now is the amount of uh, colors I am going to be going over uh, is going to be the ones from different areas, different places I, I obtained them from. And what I want to show you in chapter one first is just how many different colors different groups of people perceive as permanent rows. In other words, you can call any color you want, any name you want, but it's only going to be how you perceive it. So this is just one thing I wanted to show you real quick. This is an actual chart uh, from Windsor Newton. And these are literally little slips of watercolor paper, cold press uh, paper, with the uh, actual watercolors of each one on them to give you an extremely reliable idea of what that color would look like in the traditional painting sense. Now, those are pretty hard to get. Um, I'm glad I hung on to the one I have. But with that in mind, these colors that we're going to be going over here in chapter one could be perceived any different way, but how you perceive them is obviously the most important. So with that said, let's get started on color and pigments. Okay, let's get started. But before I get started with chapter one, I'll just show you the visual settings uh, just quickly. 
and they're going to be all just straight up fives right down the middle and then uh, the granulation i'm going to have off for this particular demo and then also uh, just to show you the, my preferences uh, they will be right here and i'll just go through them quickly uh, just show them to you a little bit at a time and then you can just stop the video if you want to just compare what what i have compared to what you're uh, using yourself uh, just to see if, if anything is really different than you could compare. Uh, this is general tools color monitor settings profile the tablet depending on what you're working on and I won't go through the keyboards because the reason why is this is going to be the new Wacom 24 I picked up. I love it. It's excellent to work on. The uh, 4K is exceptional. But since it comes with a keypad, I want to show you something just quickly. And that is the whole point of this demo. And that is to use whatever is best for you. Your style, your subject matter. And if you have to break out of the ordinary, then do whatever is best for you. Now, what I mean by that is if I press this button here, this is my settings. Now this is what it shows me that when I bring up my settings, this is pretty confusing down here for me. It is a zoom in is way over here, and then the next one down is over here, then it goes back to over here, then it goes back to over here, and it zigzags back and forth, and the text is somewhat small too, that number one, I would like to keep this on a separate screen so I could just leave it up and not have to stop working to review what's going on. I could take a quick glance. And number two is, I think I'd like them a little bit more uh, easier to read than the, the system or pattern that they have. Now, it's an exceptional screen, but I would rather change it myself as to how I read what my functions are. So what I did was this. I will bring it over, and this is what I did. I'll just enlarge it so you can see it. And what I did was just took the picture and then drew red lines to some of these. And this way, everything I need on the left side is right here. Everything I need on the right side is right here. And then straight down the middle is just stacked one on top of each other. And, and that way, I kept this particular file in layers so I could go back and change these if I need to or want to. But then also change them for different programs. Because some of them do have different settings uh, that don't cross over to other programs so I try to keep them as same as possible throughout all the programs I use but what I will actually do uh, is change them if necessary depending on what functions I have to use in each uh, actual program now with that said let's dive into chapter one okay the color and pigment uh, these colors right here from these different groups uh, again the Windsor and Newton original uh, that is like even some of the samples I have, but some are obtainable in digital form. Uh, the American Watercolor Society has a list on the artpaints.com. That's right from that website, these colors here. And the Windsor Newton PDF chart, uh, that is also a downloadable uh, chart that you could obtain that will give you some of the colors. But if you want to go by them, that's fine. But you would have to compare them side by side because the whole point of this chapter one is just to show you how different their colors are. So if you want to name a permanent rose and consider it your permanent rose, then what you perceive to be permanent rose may be up to you. In other words, if you see a whole bunch of different permanent roses, it may only confuse you as to what you think permanent rose should be. So with that in mind, uh, you might be better off just going by no comparisons and whatever you think a color should be, then call it that and that's it. Otherwise, uh, you may not even need to name your colors. Uh, I will use my specific colors all the time for good now that I finally established a very permanent set. Uh, but uh, what the tag previous, that's just my initials tag, uh, that is the previous uh, permanent rose I was using as to what I thought was permanent rose but when I started comparing it to my traditional paint colors I, I kind of started seeing something way off from my burnt siennas my raw umbers 
uh, my sepia was way too light and even a little bit on the greenish side compared to what I thought it should have been. And that was only because I was using colors given from somebody else and I wanted to establish my own colors. So I compared them only to really see how different they were, but then to establish my own colors as to what I thought it was. And in this case, uh, I actually uh, went with the, uh, the middle one and that's what I consider my permanent rose now. If I do this, then that is my permanent rose. This one was a little bit too purplish. This one was too dark, and that was my previous one. So now that I have that established, and then what I want to do now is when you are mixing colors, Rebel 5 is an exceptional program for traditional mixing colors, watercolors. And I will go here, and I will actually add a layer. And we'll just call it layer one, no big deal. But what I can't stress is have patience when the colors are mixing because they will change quite a bit. It is just like traditional watercolors. So with that said, we'll go to our bloom wet. And if I even wet the layer, that will even give more movement. Uh, we'll wet the layer and we'll verify that, that the layer is wet now. And then I will I'll just put a little bit of pasty in it. That's big enough. And then we'll grab our cobalt violet, put some down and put some cobalt blue over it. And then I'll just let them go. And then uh, through time lapse, we'll see how much it changes. Okay, here's what we started with. And then after about four minutes, reduced down to about 10 seconds, this is what we ended up with. A very different movement of color. Okay, the last thing we'll go over in chapter one, color and pigments, is just more of an observation than anything. And that is if you're lucky enough to get the opportunity to do digital watercolors, especially if you're doing any type of watercolors, for the very first time, Digitally is definitely the best way to go. Rebel 5 reproduces the mixing of colors about as close as traditional as you could get. And I can't stress that enough. And the reason why is because when you work with traditional watercolors, colors, depending on whether it's a pigment or a stain, will actually dry as much as 30 to 40% lighter than what you put it down. And for some students or some uh, newbies, that is really tough to get used to. You have to put down much more color than you really want. And then once it dries out, you're going to get a different effect of, of what you expected. I was putting it down, it's going to change a lot. Whereas if I do this digitally, any color I put down, uh, depending on whether it's a stain or an actual pigment, it's not going to matter. So once this bleeds together and once I fast dry it, what I see is what I'm going to get. And that way I can then also immediately put down different layers of colors on top of those depending on what I need. Now that's kind of important because I think for my opinion, this is only my opinion, but when I work with traditional watercolors, I don't even like to use a hair dryer because you can to speed up the process of drying. But I think it sets the paper fibers a little bit different than the original wash. So for that reason, it almost takes, for me, almost like a plasticky effect. Uh, it, it repels water to me instead of actually absorbing it like the original paper did. So for that reason, I like to actually even leave my washes set overnight, and then I will then put on the next wash after it's thoroughly air dried. But now with digital, oh boy. Uh, then now whatever you see is what you get and then you can immediately put another wash over it and when it comes to efficiency and workflow uh, there is nothing like digital watercolors now let's go on to chapter two okay chapter two layers color sequence uh, this is a little bit important depending on how much or how close you want to stay to traditional watercolors now in traditional watercolors I always work from light to dark with no return. What I mean by that is I'll start with my real light yellows, light blues, anything real light, and then go to darker and darker colors because that also makes a difference in your color sequence. Now, if I work, just say, for example, on a barn or anything, and I have various colors involved, 
I may work with burnt siennas, uh, raw umbers, blues to mix my grays. I have to work with the same color sequence, even mixing to a certain extent. And we'll go over that right now because especially in digitally, we'll have the proof right before us. Now, what I want to do is I will go to the red and yellow 100%. Now, we're not going to have any water involved in this. And then I'm going to start at 100% opacity. And being that I'm on my red and yellow layer, I will go to my red first. It's right there. And then I will actually put down a color swatch and then go to my yellow, put it down, and then now go to my yellow and red layer. And since I already have the yellow, I'll put it down on top of the red and then put the red down on top of the yellow. Now, there's not too much dramatic happening there because the colors are 100% opacity. Now, if I go to the red and yellow 75%, then I will change this to 75. Again, no water yet. I already have my red. Since we're on our red and yellow, we'll put it down first and then put yellow down. And now, now that's the red and yellow. Then now I'll go to the yellow and red. And I'll put 75% of yellow down on top of my red and then red on top of yellow. Now you can already see the big difference of the optical mix between the two. So there it's going to be pretty important of what color you put down first, depending on what you're going to end up with. Now if I go to my red and yellow 50%, we'll make this 50%. And then I'm already on my red, so I will put it down. Then go to my yellow, put it down. And then go to my yellow and red and put down the yellow on top of the red. And then the red on top of the yellow. Now the, the difference is a little bit less dramatic only because now we're down to 50. So we should expect a little bit less, even more so, on the 25%. And I will grab my red, but then we will change this to 25 and I'll put that red down and then go to the yellow, put it down and then go to my yellow and red, put the yellow down on top of the red and then put the red down on top of the yellow. Now to a certain extent, I can even still see differences uh, of over overlapped colors of how they are optically mixing, even though they're on separate layers. So if we, uh, obviously you could see the difference here between this color right in here and then this color right in here. But now if we even take a test swatch of this color here, put it down and then take a test swatch there, put it down. You can see how different the colors are of what color it's getting overall. Then the same thing here and then the same thing here. Now that's being taken off of a single layer. But now what if I actually let them mix on the same layer and then take the color samples from that? Let's try that next. I will just go down to the red and yellow. Uh, let's start off with 75%. This time I'm going to put the water the whole way up to 100. And we're going to work on the same layer and let them mix. Now we're not going to wet the layer. We'll just let the colors mix in between themselves. So then that means I will start with the red. And it's at 75% right now. And I will put it down. And then I'll put the yellow down at 75%. And then what I'll do is stay on the same layer and put the yellow over top the red and the red over top the yellow. Now these colors should be mixing. If I go to the 50, start with red first. I'll first change this to 50. Put down the red, put down the yellow, and then put the yellow down right on top of the red. Put the red down on top of the yellow, and we'll let those mix. And then we'll drop down to the 25, but we're staying on the same layer. And I'll make this 25. And since I already have my red picked, I'll put the red down, then I'll put the yellow down, and the yellow right on top of the red, and the red on top of the yellow. Now we've left these mixed for a while. We can even leave them mixed for a little bit longer, but you could still see the difference, even at 100% water, that there is going to be a difference between the colors they are mixing. And this is gonna be very important in the later chapters when we start working in transparent locked layer areas 
and we're going to be working with several different colors and how they mix and what they will produce depending on what color you put down first. That's very important because if you're looking to render a specific pattern, specific color, then how you put your colors down will make or break your, your pattern uh, that you're trying to create. Now we left them dr uh, mix a little bit. I will dry them and we will go back to, uh, it really doesn't matter uh, that the, uh, we'll go back to this one first. That's a 75. Now what I will do is then uh, just uh, look at the colors and I'll make this 75 again just for uh, complete accuracy. And But then if I take a color out of this, put it here, take a color out of that, put it there, we can see what different colors that made. If I go up to the 50, I'll make it 50%. And all it's going to do is show your mixed color at a specific opacity. That really kind of doesn't matter. And I'll pick that, put that down, pick that, put that down. And then now that's the color difference. And then the same thing, we will make this 25. And enter that. And I'll go up to the 25 and pick that one, put that one down, and pick that one, and put that one down. And then you could see that there is still a slight difference. But now how we could do that even more is if I put this up to 100, pick that color and then pick this color. Now you can see the subtle difference. And that's only point being is the less opacity you use, the less amount of difference there will be between different layer colors in different orders. But if you start using higher opacity, then the difference is gonna be quite dramatic because one color will start to cover over the color below it. And again, that is depending on how much you want to stay working digital watercolors close to traditional watercolors. Uh, but just something to think about. And again, uh, this is uh, uh, just a, an observation, uh, but it's something we need to con be concerned about for future chapters only because of how we're going to work with color patterns. And we are going to reproduce some specific uh, patterns and, and color uh, renditions of, of uh, specific layers, so to speak, of a specific order. Uh, now, with this in mind, let's move on to Chapter 3. Okay, Chapter 3, Color and Water. Uh, the only thing we're going to be concerned about in this chapter is color and water, the combinations of each, and then whether they be on dry or wet paper. Now, with watercolors, uh, one simple thing to remember is there's usually only a call for a straight edge or a call for a soft edge, depending on what you need, and this will determine how you get that. So with uh, starting off with the dry paper uh, and dry paint, that would be right here. I will actually zoom in a little bit too, just to give us some room to work with. And I'm gonna take the water all the way down to a zero, and we're still just using our flat uh, glaze brush. And what I wanna do now is just put down some dry paint uh, on our uh, dry paint on dry layer. And well, let's grab our orange. We can put that down. And then put down some red. And then maybe the cobalt violet again. And then this is just dry paint on dry paper. Nothing special here. But if I hit the show wet area, my entire dry paint area is showing wet. So this is going to be important in future chapters and then also even future steps in this chapter so now if i turn that off and then we actually move on to wet paint on dry paint here's what will happen i'll go to that layer we're still working on a dry layer so what we will do is put down some dry paint and this is how we will do that. We'll just go with the yellow then maybe. And this is dry paint on a dry paper. But we're going to put wet paint on top of this dry paint. And now if I verify that's wet, but then uh, our paper is dry. So now we are going to take our wet color. Uh, let's go with cobalt blue. Now we're going to 
crank up the water all the way to 100% just for that uh, a, a really nice effect of an instant change. And now that I'm on the dry paint, on dry paper, here's what happens when I put wet paint across it. Hmm. What's happening is, uh, what I will do is, when the wet paint goes on the dry paper, it stays right where it's supposed to, right where it goes down. But when it goes on the dry paint, we showed it that being wet, it's starting to bleed out really fast. Now what I want to do is I will hit the fast dry, which is right here, or just F on your keyboard, either one. That's the first time we'll use this, but we will use this quite a bit throughout all of these chapters. And then now you can see what we have. Uh, but if you wanted straight edges, then if you have dry paper, uh, then no matter whether the paint is wet or dry, it's going to give you a straight edge. But then how the paints mix will depend on whether they're dry or wet going down. So that's kind of important to think of uh, in future renderings of depending on what kind of textures you're trying to create. Now, if we go to dry paint on wet paper, that would be down here. Now, this is wet paper. So what I will do is wet the paper and then that layer is wet. Now, if I verify that my entire uh, layer is wet, so I will turn that off and now we will go to uh, dry paint and then now if I put down the orange and then let's go with orange and then let's go with the cobalt violet and then maybe some red again now here's the interesting part about this even though the paper is wet because I'm putting down dry paint it's staying right where it's supposed to right where I put it down so if I want a straight edge even though my paper may be wet I could go back in with completely dry paint and make straight edges if I need them. So, and now I'm not going to be able to mix those because they're not mixing, but that's only if I want a straight edge. So there's a couple of things to think about here. So now if we go to the next one, this is wet paint on wet paper. Then what will happen is I will wet this layer. Uh, let's just go up to here and hit wet layer. I can verify that again. Now my paper is wet. Turn that off. But now if I stay with the wet paint, this is what will happen. Uh, let's go with the cobalt violet first. And if I put that down and then put down red and maybe a little bit of orange. Now this is what's happening with wet paint on wet paper. It's going to bleed out in every direction because I do not have the tilt on it's off but the paper is wet and the paint is wet so with those uh, parameters in mind this is what's happening uh, to my paint on my paper interestingly enough that I put down a straight edge it's staying a straight edge uh, but then it is carrying into itself and out much bigger than it originally started so now with these effects in mind uh, let's move on to chapter four Okay, chapter 4A, uh, I'm just going to name these all chapter 4, but then each one will have a corresponding letter. Uh, the reason why is I'm going to use a full page uh, for each one of these demos when it comes to the brushes. Now, this one is brush size and DPI. Now, we're going to be using a lot of brushes for a lot of the different demos here coming up and the chapters that are going to be involved. This one is going to have to do with if you start designing your own brushes or if you even start changing the ones you already have, if you're trying to create specific textures, especially textures that have a proportion to them. In other words, if you want a, a small pattern, large pattern, medium pattern, then you make sure you stay with the same DPI of paper. And I'll show you why. Now we got a dry sand brush here and I call it sand because I want it to be in proportion to the size of sand compared to the paper I'm working on. So if I take my red, that way we'll be able to see it real good. And I make my actual uh, brush strokes here, crossed here. But what I'll do is I made the brush pretty much the size of the literally the word chapter. And I want you to note that because what I'll do then is I'm going to just do a couple of test strokes straight across here. And then you could see it is pretty much the size of sand. But if I go up here now and then hit edit and then actually hit image size 
and then I'm going to change this to inch and then now I'm also going to then change this to 100 so instead of it being 12 inches by 12 inches by 300 dpi it's going to be 12 inches by 12 inches at 100 dpi now i'm changing it quite a bit to make this obvious but that is the point uh just to show you the difference so now if i hit okay it's going to resize it at that value and we'll let it do its thing and then now it's uh at 12 but now look at the size of the brush it immediately got much larger so my point is, if you start designing brushes and you want a specific texture in mind, make sure you design that brush, or even more importantly, just always work on the same DPI. Again, I work at 300. I can always shrink it down if I want to put it up on a web or anything else, but I want it ready to go for print if I ever wanted to do something with anything I design for print. Now, if I go with that same brush, this is what I'm going to get, and it's not fine sand anymore. The texture and, and size proportion of it now is uh, way bigger than, than what the original brush design was. And then even if I make the brush a good bit smaller, I'm still going to get that same size texture. If I change the color, then you can see the comparison. And what will happen is it's technically changing my brush because of the percentages involved. So if you want to keep with a specific size texture or design of your brush, then try to keep everything that you're doing with it the same. And that would be uh, the DPI of the image size that you're working on. If you get what you expect of your brushes, uh, that will make your uh, painting and drawing much more enjoyable. Let's go on to chapter 4B. Okay, chapter 4B, this is brush shapes with water. Again, if you're going to consider making your own brushes or even just adjusting the ones you have, then you may want to start off very basic. In other words, no water involved. Because remember, a few chapters back, when we started making our own brush strokes, if the brush stroke included water in the paint, then it would carry that color out towards the edges and it will give you a different brush stroke than you may have originally wanted or designed. So if you start with no water at all, then that will give you the true brush stroke that you're looking for. And then the water and a few other variables could change that same brush. Uh, uh, let's start with the, the wet mop here. Now I'm gonna take the water all the way down and I'll show you what I mean. We'll leave it that size and then we'll even go with the red here. And we'll make a couple of practice strokes. And this one, is how it would be with the soft edge designed and that's the way it would be showing as a, a wet but i know it's wet and this is what i would actually get if i add water to it and again i'll go the whole way to the opposite end to show you as much difference there is so now if i do this when it's wet with all the water in the brush this is what's going to happen to the brush stroke it's going to carry that pigment out to the edges and then I'm going to get a dark edge at the very edge of the brush stroke instead of a nice soft edge. So the water is doing that for me, but then I'm also even getting a darker edge than what the color was itself. And that's only because I have the visual settings edge darkening set at four. Now, if I took that down all the way to zero, then I'm not going to get any edge at all. But it's still, again, these variables will also determine what your brush stroke is going to look like. So just something to keep in mind, uh, you could check out the, uh, the in-depth demo I have about uh, brush sh uh, shapes and then just creating your own brushes. Even though it's Rebel 4, it will still apply to 5. Uh, there's just more adjustments in 5 uh, other than the shapes and everything else will still apply. And especially to give you a better idea of just how shapes overlap and what's happening uh, when they do. So now I have the exact opposite of the brush stroke. And because of that, uh, this brush uh, would give me two completely different end results depending on how much water I have with the brush. Let's go on to chapter 4C. Chapter 4C, capturing a brush shape. This is just going to be a very general demo. 
But what I want to show you the most is just how much little things can affect your brushes. And when you start adjusting them, there's a lot of variables behind the scene. This is just to give you a rough idea how much it could affect it when you're trying to create textures or brushes that you want to work with. Uh, the entire demo of creating your own brushes would be much more thorough and, and give you a good start to finish a designed brush. Now this one, if I want to capture a brush shape and go from there, then all I have to do is go up to Window, and then right here, uh, it just Brush Creator. Now it's already checked because I always keep it out. Uh, you could either hit F5 or just Brush Creator right here, and then that's this right here, and I will open it up, and here's all my shapes. Now again, we're not going to get into all of these adjustments. That would be for the, the Brush Creator demo. And then what we do want to do, though, is just a quick idea to show you that if I click on this to shape, right here is just the import selection. So we could easily make a brush, and I'll show you how quick we could do that. Uh, let's go down to our splash texture, and we don't want any water for this for now, uh, just to design the shape that we're going to use. And I will take the opacity down. We're just going to make a light daub of color and then uh, that size is okay and what I want to do is use black and then we're going to just give it a little light texture like this and then I'm going to go to something a little bit more pronounced the spot and then I want to turn the opacity way up I'll make it bigger but no water and then I'll put these down of heavy dots so they're just real dark dots on top of uh, I just like a lighter cloud of softness and now if I want to uh, take my selection tool which right here and then just make a selected square right around it about right there I'll enter that and then now all I have to do is click this button right here import selection so if I click on that there's my new brush already now, if I want to try that out, I have to hit Control D to deselect so I can work on the rest of the paper. But now, just say, for example, if I go to the uh, my uh, flat glaze, I set everything back to the way it was so I could see what the new brush will do. And then now, if I actually select our new shape that we just designed, that's it right there. I'll make it a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on. Now, I don't want no water again just to see what it does. And I'll turn up the opacity a little bit to see what it will do. But we're going to use red just so we can really see what's going on here. If I use it, there's what our new brush is doing. So it's giving us a nice wispy effect of just uh, a, a kind of a dry brush effect. You can see kind of like the bristles that are when you stop and when you start. It's doing a pretty decent job already. But if I add water to it, then it's going to give me a completely different effect. And I'll put up the opacity a little bit so we can see better what's going on. If I go down now, then what's going to happen is the same thing. The pigment is going to carry out to the ends, and it's going to give me a real subtle ragged edge at the start at the end, but nice straight edges on the sides. So that would give me a completely different brush stroke. Again, depending on how much uh, edge darkening I have set in the visual settings will determine how dark the edges will actually go. But here is the difference. Now, here's with no water, here's with water. So that's how much that particular brush that we just designed is already changing. Now, there again, if you start designing your own brushes, then sometimes I even like to actually uh, include uh, what I will set this one back to normal uh, the way it was. But then I like to even actually include the all, all the uh, the volumes uh, the paint modes and everything then that way if i want to design just a blender then that's all it's going to be but then sometimes i need just a blender so if you want to save the paint mode with it and then all of the volumes it's for example sometimes important to save the volumes too because my script brushes they are the real thin rigor brushes that only get so big and that's it. So I have the minimum sizes set way down and the, the percentages set way down to maybe 300 instead of 700. But then my mops are the much bigger of the same version, but they start off bigger. 
So then because I work with traditional brushes a lot, when I actually grab a brush, I know what to expect. It's only going to be so big, no bigger. If I want a real big brush, then I'll grab a big mop and then I'll know it's going to be big to start with, but then I won't have an infinite amount of adjustment in between them. Now, how many brushes you want to have and how you set them up is completely up to you because that's going to depend on your brush uh, selection of what you use as a subject matter and then also your style. Uh, will make a big difference. But the big difference here is whether you add water or not to the brush that you're creating, and you're going to get two completely different effects with the exact same brush. Let's go on to chapter 4D. Okay, chapter 4D, brush and grain choice. Now here's what I want to go over, just a couple of brief things that may help you out in this last part of chapter 4 about brushes. Again, two things. One is make sure if you really want to get involved in brush creation, then just watch that demo. Even though it's Rebel 4, it will still apply. And then number two is, again, download uh, my exact brush sets I use right now. And then you could download them from the free assets part of the Escape Motions uh, website. But then keep in mind, I always work on 300 DPI. So again, just like previous chapters, if uh, you see one effect here, you may see something slightly different if you work at a different DPI. So what I'm working at is 300, so please keep that in mind. Now, what I want to show you in this last part of the chapter 4 is if I go with my Bloom Wet right here, and then I'm going to turn the water all the way down to zero for now, this one. And then we'll just use our cobalt violet. And we'll, uh, we already have that picked. We'll use that. And if I put this down, this is the effect I'm going to get. And because I have no water to it, it's going to stay like that. So that's kind of important because I want to show you one thing. Now, this brush is created with my own fog pattern and then uh, the sponge as a grain. So these little white spots you see in here are from the sponge and then the softer edges are from the fog shape. Now that's kind of important, not the shape and the grain, but whether it has water or not. And this is what I wanted to show you in this part of it. So now if I add water to it, I could do this and then it's going to start changing because of the water. Now how fast I fast dry it will give me different effects and different techniques throughout that same brush. So now if I just leave it go, I'm going to get softer and darker areas. It'll, it'll kind of bleed out into a real nice ragged edge, but then it will also diffuse those white spots uh, that are from the sponge grain. So again, now just depending on adding water to it and then how fast I fast dry it, then that will give me uh, two, three, four completely different brushes. And then that way uh, I could do that. Now we're going to show you one last thing here. And that is if you want to load up. And that's why I don't have full screen on. Now I'm going to do this. Now if I uh, say for example have shapes and grains. Here's my shapes. Now just say for example that I wanted a shape or a grain. Or even load up a whole bunch of grains or shapes within my shape or grain library. Here's just a real easy workaround. Uh, say for example I'll just do it with one. There's my sponge right there. Say for some reason I wanted that particular shape in my shape library and not the grain library. So if I bring up the shapes, there it is. I don't have no sponge in here. So if I go back here and I'll actually copy that, and I copied it, and then what I could do is go back to the shape, and then, and then what I'll do is paste it, but that doesn't work. So what I can actually do is just go up here and go to the help, and go to show library folders and then here's all the folders if I go to brushes now here's the shapes and grains now if I go to grains and then pick my sponge out or any other ones that I want and then go back to shapes and then paste it here it is right here but it's not going to come up until you shut down Rebel and open it back up now let's try that just real quick here I'll close that out now we could see in shapes there is no uh, sponge at all, but then if I close this down and close down Rebel, and then we're going to, uh, yes, we will save that. And then if I uh, close that down and then open it back up, let's see what happens. Okay, we'll open up the last one. 
And then if we go to the actual uh, shapes again, open it up, there's our sponge. So what we could do is, if you even want to flip flop shapes for whatever reasons, I found that to be a lot easier workaround than sometimes trying to import or just work with one at a time. If I have a whole bunch of shapes I've created, even in other programs, then I could just put them straight into the library through the folder system and then just close out the program, reopen it up, and it will pick up the new shapes the next time it reopens. So with all that in mind, let's go on to chapter five. Okay, chapter five, we're going to be using the water tool in this chapter, but we're gonna try and catch some things I know I never talked about before, but maybe even uh, some simple things that could easily be overlooked. Let's take a look and see what we could find out here. And that is, I'm gonna first enlarge this a little bit. Now this is gonna be wash on wash. And the, the reason why I wanted you to consider this is, I'll show the wet area, which is this button right here, and I'm going to start with this splash pattern. Now, if I put down water, that's just plain water because it's just showing wet area. But now, if you look real close, you could see water moving within the water pattern. If I go to another brush, you'll see it much easier. This will be a darker uh, swash of light blue over the water, and you'll see this just water blending in with what water is already there. So if I do this now, and it's gonna be a darker blue, but then now you could see where the darker blue is actually blending in with the water that's already there. So point being is you may get some paint movement within these areas that may be a little bit irregular compared to what you think you're going to get. So for that reason, what we could do is fast dry it, and then now your wet area is all the same amount of wetness. So if I put a color down now, then it's only going to react between the dry paper and the wet area. So for an example, well, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but we'll try this. And that is we'll use the red. If I put a, a just, a, just a, a, a quick brush stroke down of red, now it's going to be bleeding out into those wet areas, but then where it's dry, it's gonna stop and start making a strong texture or shapes, whatever it's doing, but what it'll do is it will only react to either the water or the dry paper, and not necessarily clear water moving within itself that may change your outlook or what your technique or your effect uh, or texture of what you're looking for will be or will end up. So that reason, if I turn on the show wet again, now it's very uh, even as to what the movement's doing. It's only moving throughout wherever the water is and wherever I put the uh, just a brush stroke down of red and then that's it. So again, if you start layering multiple layers of just water with the water tool, once you're done, you may wanna fast dry it just to even up the wet surface and then paint from there. Okay, let's go on to the uh, next one, which would actually be dry paint movement. Okay, let's move on to the dry paint movement. And this is another one that's very subtle, but you might wanna uh, be careful with it if you spend some time making any specific texture uh, or pattern. Uh, in other words, we'll give ourselves some room. We could turn off the show wet and I will give ourselves some room so we could see what we're doing here. And then what this involves is if you're using the tilt and you want to create uh, any type of drips then consider this while you're making your drips and that is if i actually just go to uh, let's stay with the uh, spots wet and i will use the prussian blue and then we'll put that down now that's moving now i'll fast dry it that's what we'd get if we fast dry but now remember Obviously, the uh, layer is still wet. So if I show that, then I can see that it's still wet. So if I dry the layer completely, now the dry layer is obviously dry, but here's what will happen if I actually put more color or something else on top of it, especially with the water tool, and we'll see what happens. We'll just put down clear water on top of this and we'll just leave it go for a while. 
And even though the layer was dry, it's still picking up my color and moving it. So now what I'm doing is I have it cranked up pretty good, have a lot of water to it. So if you have your settings much more subtle, then what will happen is it may be much more of a subtle change of your painting that you may not realize what's going on. But even though the layer was dry, it's still picking up the color and carrying it which would actually be like traditional watercolors. The reason why is many of the watercolor artists I know will use an atomizer spray bottle to actually spray on top of pre-existing paint, even if it's dry, just so a brush does not touch a pre-painted area. So that way you're not gonna be worried about lifting up any color or moving any color once you start to get your design down. Now with that in mind, let's see. Now I might have a mess here now. And what I'll do is actually just hit uh, the undo and then fast dry just where it's at. Now that we know that it'll move even though the layer is dry. Let's move on to color on water patterns. Okay, next let's take a quick look at just some color on water patterns. Uh, just what we could come up with. I'll enlarge it again here just to see what we're doing. And then again, now this would be color and water patterns. So if I actually uh, put down some water patterns first, and I'll show my wet area, we're gonna turn off the tilt. Uh, but if I do this, let's put that back on. Now here is some patterns, but now here's the thing. If I actually even then just go with that same type of brush with color, then this is what will happen. Uh, this is it right here, splash texture, and then this is roughly the same. But if I mix up the brushes, then we're going to get different effects because there's only certain areas of the paper that are already wet. So we're going to get a very specific texture other than just putting paint down on just dry paper. So if I start with this one, let's go with some decent colors here. I'll turn it down a little bit, and we'll leave the water up. And now this is what's going to happen with this one. And then now if I put, let's go with a cobalt blue. And I will put the, uh, but we'll change a brush. Uh, let's go with a splatter, spray heavy. Let's try that one right here. And if I just put down some of this texture, then these are going to start blending out too. But then what they're also going to do is they're only going to blend in the wet areas that I have. So now if everything is wet, then if I turn this off again and put some up here, then some of these are going to stay straight edge and others are going to blend into what water is already there. So now I'm going to get some really interesting, what would be called a bloom, uh, as far as colors blending and bleeding together and getting some edges here and there. But then again, if I put some out here, then where the water is, it's going to blend in. And that's nice that you could put down a color first, and then let things blend or bleed. But if you don't want to put down any color first and just put down water, so you don't have to start with a color you don't want, so to speak. In other words, if I put down blue first, I can, but then that will only react to the pattern that I am putting down. It's going to react to the pattern of water also, which would give me a different effect. So in other words, it's just like a pre-wash, that's all. But a pre-wash with a very specific texture. Okay, let's move on to just water patterns on color now. Okay, let's take a look at water patterns on color now. We're going to enlarge this so we can see what we're doing again. Take it down just a little bit and give us ourselves some more room here to work. And then what I want to do is I'm going to put some color down now. And then so if I go to my watercolor brush, uh, we'll, we'll let's go with the Bloom Wet. Or no, let's have a stronger texture. And we will use, this time we'll use red. And uh, we'll just have just 10% water, no big deal there. Uh, but what's, what, what we'll see the difference will be is when we put down this color, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the water tool, but this time we're gonna put a splash texture here, the splash course, and then a round over here and these are the two different patterns and or textures we will get 
So depending on what kind of brush you use to put your water down, you're going to get a completely different effect. You may get a linear pattern here because of the round brush stroke, or you may get a what will be called a bloom uh, that would carry your paint in just different directions, uh, very uh, spontaneous. But over here, you're getting a different type of linear pattern that will just actually carry your paint uh, in a very specific way also. So once you have color down, depending on how you apply clear water over top of that uh, color is going to also uh, vary your end result and or texture. Let's move on to chapter six. Okay, let's move on to chapter six, the dry tool sponge, uh, dry tool or sponge, whatever you want to call it. We're going to make this bigger so we can see what we're doing. Now you can use this a couple of different ways, just even in this first uh, demo right here, we have three more to go on this particular tool. But in this one, just say for example, we start off with uh, just, just water, and I'll show the wet area. We'll put it down, but then say for example, if we're putting down water in a specific way, but we could even fine tune that. If we go to our dry tool, we'll put the uh, absorbency all the way up because we're going to get into that a little bit but if we go to the splatter if I go back over that water I could fine-tune that wet area however I want then that way uh, I will be left with a specific pattern different from what whatever brush I used first because I'm taking one brush pattern over another and it'll leave me with a very different pattern depending on what combination of brushes I use uh, but now also if I go to my watercolor brush and then if I, I will take this off and then I will put a layer of color down. Let's go with the old cobalt violet again. If I put this down and then just leave it react. And then if I go to my dry tool, just like say, for example, uh, we use the, this uh, circle brush and I want the absorbency all the way up. What will happen is if I take a swatch past that, what it's going to do is it's going to dry that specific area. So it's going to change how the color is mixing and I will actually get some hard edges because now that's where the paint is trying to carry the pigment, but it's stopping at the dry place on the paper. So if I do that a couple of different times or actually go with a different pattern, then what's going to happen is it's going to create different effects and or textures within my moving paint. So that will change things quite a bit also when you use your dry tool over moving wet color. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, now with the dry layer absorbency, it's close to the same thing, but we're going to get a little bit different. And again, we'll enlarge it so we can see what we're doing here. And we'll put it right there. But now this time what we'll do is if we put color down, let's go with... Uh, Let's try the French Ultramarine this time. We'll make it a little bit bigger. And then we're going to put a lot of water in it. And then we will stay with the same Bloom Wet. And if we put it down, things are going to be moving around pretty quick because we got a lot of water in it. But then if we go to the Dry Tool, we could put down one effect here. But then if we put down the Absorbency way down, then what we could do is put another effect here. And what it's going to do is it's going to slow down the process but not stop it completely. Over here, it stopped the process of the color blending out and it's going to give us hard edges, but here it's just slowing it down. So if I put on the actual uh, show wet, you can even see that there are some spots here. If I move it up a little wee bit more, then you can see that it's taking out the water but it's not taking out completely. So in other words, it's just slowing down the mixing process, but not stopping it completely like over here. If I take the absorbency all the way up again and do it over here, then it's taking all the water out. So I'm gonna have hard edges over here where the color meets the dry paper, but over here it's just slowing down and you can see the different effect that we're getting between just changing the absorbency within the wet color moving on the paper. Okay, now let's go to uh, dry and then what we'll do is we'll keep the layer wet on or keep the layer wet off. Let's go to the next one. 
Okay, let's go into whether we keep the layer wet on or off. And that's more for what you're going to do with the next uh, layer of color. And I will show you that right now. We'll enlarge it just so we can see what we're doing here. And then now if I go to my uh, watercolor brush, I will put down, uh, we'll just stay with the uh, cobalt violet. And if I put down a layer of color, and if I leave then it on, so I'll put it on, but if I use that brush here and I go like this, then what it'll do is it'll stop it from mixing, but it'll only slow it down to a certain extent that it's still leaving the layer, layer wet. So if I want that the way it is now to prevent it from mixing anymore, I will fast dry it. But what I did was left that entire area wet. So if I wanted to go on with another layer of color, then my entire working area is wet. Now if I go over here and turn it off, then I will do the watercolor brush. We'll stay with the cobalt violet, put it down. But this time if I go to the uh, dry tool and turn it off, then what I will be doing is drying that permanently. So now uh, the colors will be mixing on this side and on this side. They'll keep going because that area is still wet. But what I did was dry the center and I also lost my uh, entire working wet area for good. So that's going to change how I put down the next color. And then uh, if I'm working with a dry paper or a wet paper, uh, I am showing the wet area now, it's dry. So I'm not leaving the layer wet any longer once I dry at that time. So it's going to depend on whether you want to leave uh, your entire working area wet. So leave it on. Or if you want another specific uh, technique or, or texture, then if I take another layer of color, uh, let's just go with a different color. Uh, let's just go with a blue. Now, now if I take it over that, it's going to react differently because this area is wet up here. This area is wet down here, but this area is dry, so I'm going to be left with a sharp edge here and softer edges down here. So again, it'll be completely two different effects now whether you keep the layer wet on or off. Let's go to Chapter 7. Okay, Chapter 7, just the eraser, and this will depend on whether we keep the wet on or off, whether it'll be wet or dry, and you'll see what I mean. But what we're going to do first is start with watercolor. Now, I have a guideline there for a reason, and I'll show you why. Now, what I'm going to do is first zoom in a little bit so we can see what we are doing. We'll center it up a little bit right there. Back it off just a shade. And then now what I'll do is take some, well, let's go with the cobalt violet, and we'll mix it down. Then we'll put some cobalt blue. And then get crazy and put a little bit of orange in it, just a little bit. And we'll let those mix a little bit. And then what I'll do is fast dry it. We're getting some nice textures here and there of where it's bubbling out. And I have the water uh, cranked all the way up at the opacity. It's kind of low. Now, what I want to do is I'm getting some very interesting mixing colors here, again, in a very spontaneous watercolor type of way. Now, I'll fast dry that just so everything stays right where it's at. Uh, but now, what I want to do is just for eraser's sake, number one is just say, for example, I wanted to lighten this end up or even gradate a little bit. If I have patterns that I want my patterns to be stronger in the foreground, but then I want to gradate them out to just a softer, uh, less contrasty, lighter in color, then what I could do is just go with the eraser. But then what I'll do is, is grab maybe just this splash. Now remember, if I go back to the watercolor, just as an ultra quick review, if I click on any one of these and then hit... Uh, copy brush preset and then go back to the eraser and then hit paste brush preset 
Here's the new brush preset I just pulled out of the, the watercolors. So that is important that if you come up with some kind of texture you really like or you want to use in different tools, and that could be the water tool, uh, the watercolor brush, uh, the pencil, uh, the eraser, whatever you want to use it in, uh, that is something to consider also. But we're going to use this one right here. And then depending on, now this is if I keep the layer wet off, so it is off. And then what I will do is turn the opacity down to start off with. And I'm using a texture. Say if I want to just blend this out a little bit, I'm only taking a little wee bit off at a time. And this is going to give me the opportunity to soften up the contrast and then also gradate it out if I want to. And I could totally take this down to pure white if I want to. And this will give me a chance uh, to control my patterns. In other words, I have a really nice, interesting, spontaneous pattern here. But if I want to do specific things with it, then this will give me the opportunity to change things around a little bit. Now, if I want to add a very strong uh, pattern or texture to that, if I turn up the opacity, then I'm going to start erasing much more color at one pass, and I'm going to really start changing things uh, much quicker. But because we have the keep layer wet off, then what I could do is show you that I'm also pulling water out too. So that would affect any color layers coming after that but here's what i also want to show you now if i i'll put this off so it's not confusing now if i go to the move tool which is right here now i don't have a chapter on a move tool but we will use it every now and then because to a certain extent it really isn't going to help us control our color but if i like what's going on here and i want this orange in a specific place or anything like that what i would actually do then is move this around and if this is our guideline, just any old guideline of some kind of shape we're painting in, but I want to move my texture around, depending on how I want to use it within that shape, then I could just leave it right there and then go back to the eraser and that'll set it in place. And even if I want a real hard edge, then I could use this one and then I'll even zoom in a little bit and then I could go right around that guideline and use the exact part of that shape that mixed together that I would want. And that's a very nice opportunity that if you do work on separate layers and you're mixing colors on separate layers, then you want to go back in and then just use a very specific part of your mixture. Then you could actually go right around your guideline. I'm doing this very fast. Uh, go right around your guideline. And then just pick what exact mixture you want by moving it around within the shape that you're working in. So in other words, you can even just leave it bleed out a lot further and leave the paint just happen whatever way it wants to happen. But then move it around and pick and be selective as to what area of that mixture you want to use. Then this will give you a chance to even be a little bit more specific on how you want something to use. Whether you want it to gradate in a specific area or if you want to get rid of some of the mixtures that you don't think you really need. Now, if we erase and keep the layer wet on, let's see what that does. What I will do is actually enlarge it again. And uh, that should be good right there. And then now this one, we'll go up to this one and we will uh, paint again a little bit of colors. And I will just use that one right there, whatever we got. And then uh, let's see, we'll add some water to this one. I'll use the bloom wet. We'll go to a different orange, make it a little bit smaller. And we'll leave things blend here. And then some blue. And then I'll leave that work. And there was a lot of water in there, so things are going to change quite a bit. And we could see some ragged, nice ragged edges, different things going on down here, um, up in here. Uh, we'll leave it work a little bit. But then now what I do is if I go to my eraser, but then keep layer wet on, if I start erasing, it's going to remove color, but not the water. So what that will do is then it will leave the colors mixed continuously. So if I go to a soft round and I take this off down here 
this is going to still be mixing because everything is still wet. So you can see the color starting to pour back down into that area. So what I will do is lift up colors. Mm. But it will still move on me because the uh, layer is remaining wet. If I go to this one especially and start pulling out shapes, then those are going to start slowly filling back in. So I'm creating an instant new texture just by allowing the layer to remain wet. If I take the opacity way down or way up, that will also change how quick I pull out the color, but not the water. Now that's already kind of getting a real fine uh, snowy pattern, if you will. And again, just depending on what you're looking for, the opacity is uh, all the way up, but the water is allowing the actual paint and colors to mix back together where you already pulled out color. So for that reason, you could change again, even yet another texture on top of what you already have. Let's move on to chapter eight. Okay, chapter eight, uh, this is the fill bucket. Uh, this will give you just a couple of options if you want to uh, lay down a specific area with uh, a very nice even coat of color. And what we'll do is zoom in again so we can see what we're doing here. And I am going to start off with the watercolor brush. We're gonna use our script and then we are going to leave the a PC about right there and I will use this time uh, just a cobalt violet again but I'm going to make an odd shape here and you'll see why here in a minute for a couple of different adjustments here as long as I keep painting and I don't lift up my pen I'll get a nice even layer of color of whatever value I have it set at or opacity I should say all right now we're there now what I want to do now is take a soft brush we'll go to the blue cobalt blue and it's a soft edge and I'm going to put it on top of that and we will see the difference of a couple of things here now, what I want to show you first is if we go to the fill bucket the difference between anti-aliasing and not anti-aliasing now if I zoom in to, we're going to look at this here. Now if I have the anti-aliasing off, let's use black. Uh, well, let's use uh, burnt sienna right there. And now if I have anti-aliasing off, I have the tolerance set about 20. Now we're going to adjust that quite a few different ways, two different times, because we have to fine tune that to get what we want. And you'll see what I mean. Now if I touch the blue now, this is what I'm getting. I will zoom in even more. We're already 170, there's 250, there's 300%. We're getting a fairly ragged edge. It's a sawtooth edge, it's very hard. Now, if I undo that and then hit anti-aliasing on and touch it again, now that's what we're getting. It's a very nice soft edge and it pretty much blended in with the soft edge of the brush so it tapered it down and feathered it in for us very nicely. But now, let's go back out. And we're going to see this whole shape. And what I want to do for you is over here, I am going to go back to my watercolor brush. And just with the script, we're going to take it down in size. The opacity will take up. And we're going to put a black line. And we're going to do this like that and then this is the difference between contiguous and not now if I go back to my fill bucket I only have the tolerance of 20 if I hit uh, let's say let's go with um, red and if I hit that without the contiguous on this is what I will get it will fill up that entire shape uh, because it's pulling out the color that you're touching but now if I hit the contiguous, first I will undo that. Then if I hit the contiguous on, this is what I will get. Just inside the black. It will stop at whatever color difference there is. So in other words, 
what I will do is if I have the contiguous off, it's going to pull out that value of that color anywhere it's at. So in other words, if I even made more strokes of black, oh, well, let's do that. First, we'll undo this. And then just quickly, we will go back and then we will hit we on black. We'll make another shape here. Make another shape here. And we'll go back to the fill bucket. The contiguous is on. And then now we'll go back to our red, hit this area. Now I'm picking out everything but. If I take the contiguous off, I'll undo that. I'm getting everything again. So now if I undo that and put contiguous on, then touch here, touch here, touch here, I'm only filling in those exact areas. And that's the difference between contiguous on and contiguous off. Now let's move down to the actual contiguous with alpha will make a difference okay moving on to contiguous with alpha this gets a little bit interesting i'll again move it in zoom in a little bit and then what will happen is we will go to our watercolor brush i'm going to turn the opacity way down and you'll see why and then we'll just use that particular mop now we're going to go with a real light wash of orange like that and then like that and then I'm going to take a darker blue over top of it and you'll see what we're up to just like that. Now we have four separate shapes of the same value of, of orange. So now if I go to my uh, fill bucket and this is how we're going to do this. First we're going to turn off the use alpha and I'm going to use black just so we can easily see what it's doing. Now if I touch here, that's what I get. I touch there, that's what I get. If I touch here, that's what I get. And I touch here, that's what I get. And we're all using a tolerance of 20. And we don't want, uh, we, we want to keep the tolerance way down because we're using very light colors here. And then now if I undo that four times, here's what's gonna happen if we use the alpha. We'll turn it on. Now if I touch it here, Guess what? Now what it's doing is even though the opacity is at 100, it's matching the black to the alpha orange color. So in other words, you have a very light value of orange, so it's giving you a very light value of black. So now what it'll do is give me that same black amount on all the areas of the same orange I have. But now this is what I'll also do. And that is I'll undo these four. And then if I also take the contiguous off, then what I'll do is touch one of these, all four of them go. And the reason why is it's matching any value of that orange across the paper, even though they're separate, and even though blue is dividing them, then what it's doing is it's still coloring in all four of those shapes of the same value of orange at the same time. And that's what the alpha will do without the contiguous. There's different things going on there. Uh, without the alpha, I will get that very dark black 100% opacity with alpha. I'm getting the value of black that will match the value of orange. And then also, with or without contiguous, I will grab all the entire values of orange that are alike all at the same time or not. Now, here's what I also want to show you. And that would be this right here. But for this one... We're going to zoom out and just show the entire page. And then I have the contiguous on and off. And here's what we'll do. We have the fill bucket here. And I'm just going to go to a yellow. And I'm going to fill the entire page. Now if I touch down, nothing's happening. And the reason why is I still have use alpha on. If I use alpha, there is no color there at all. So it's not going to work. If I touch anything with color, it's going to work. But now what will happen is, if I actually, I'll undo that. If I take alpha off, then I touch down here. Now it's going to fill in my entire background. But now look what it did since the text is on the same layer as that, that I have my contiguous on. So if I undo that, turn off my contiguous, now the entire page is yellow. Not, not the gaps in between the letters that are closed off and sealed, 
like right here, right here, and right here. So now with that in mind, then what it did, because my tolerance is so low, it only filled in the white of the area and it left everything else the colors that they originally were or the, 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 what we added to them with the fill. Let's move on to chapter nine. Okay, chapter nine, pause diffusion, whether it's on or off. Now this is gonna be pretty much straightforward and this will only take a few minutes, very basic, but it could make a big difference. And what I mean by that is we will start on layer one. We'll go through our watercolor brushes and we'll start using any kind of brushes. And what I will do is zoom in again so we can see what we're doing. And now the diffusion is off. Okay, so now if I wet this layer, we can verify that it is wet. And then I turn off the show wet area. But then if I start working with any kind of colors, this could be anything you're working on, whether it be subject matter, style, and I'll just use some different brushes here too, even just to mix them up. And then we'll also mix up whether or not it has water in it. And then we'll mix up some more brushes. And then we will actually try a different color Now what's happening is I am putting down some of these at the very end. If I put this down and change the opacity, I'm putting this down. Now if I hit fast dry, this over here has been mixing quite a long time. I put this down first and then this in here and then went into the burnt sienna here. And now this is finally starting to change. But my point is, is when you start laying down colors, and then you start jumping to different brushes, different colors, different values. The whole time you're doing that, your first layer of colors are already mixing and things are already changing. So if you want the same effect throughout your entire mix, then we would go down to here and then actually turn the, uh, we will go to the next layer, but then turn the right here, the pause diffusion on and then we will show the wet area what i could do is even wet this layer again but now what i will do is turn that off but now go to same thing any kind of brushes with any kind of colors and we will grab a burnt sienna with a straight edge we'll put a lot of water to it and then we could even go to a blue, grab another different type of brush. Nothing's happened, which is great. I could do anything I want for as long as I need to. And then at the very end, take the pause diffusion, turn it off. And now everything will start to mix all at the same time. All the different colors, all the different brushes, whatever I need to use or put down to maybe design a specific tree line or anything else I'm doing, a specific side of a building or whatever, if I don't want my stucco areas to blend too fast in one place, but not at all in another place, then what I could do is put down all the different pastel colors, whatever makes up that side of the stucco building, and then turn the pause diffusion off, and then everything will start mixing at the same time. To a certain extent, you'll have more control over your mix, and then you could stop it when you want to, and then you'll get pretty much the same effect throughout the entire mix, depending on what brushes, colors, and opacities you're using. Let's move on to chapter 10. Okay, chapter 10, the marquee tool. Uh, we're gonna go over the marquee shapes, the different shapes, then making a selection and adding and subtracting to it, uh, using a selected area and then resizing it using the transform tool. There is a couple of tricks there other than just uh, trying to grab something and resize it. And I'll show you that. And then we'll go into the magic wand and discuss the different tolerances as to how we could select specific areas and try and fine tune our selection. Let's take a look at the marquee shapes first. Okay, let's go to the marquee shapes. I'm gonna zoom in again just so we can see what we're doing here. And we're gonna start off, here's the marquee. Uh, selection tool right here 
and then this is the different shapes. We'll go through all of them. And then this is the different uh, modes that we could use, whether it be add, subtract to, invert. We're going to go through all those too. Uh, but right now we're going to just concentrate on drawing a rectangle of any kind. So if I move this up or down, left or right, I will be able to make any size I want. But then just say, for example, I want this shape here. Then all I have to do is hit enter, and then that will be my selected area. Now, if I want a perfect square, then all I have to do is hold the shift down as I'm pulling one of the corners, and it will make me a perfect square, whatever size I want. And if I say, for example, want this uh, right here, this shape, uh, wait, we'll make it a perfect square. And then now if I use this particular area, uh, if I go back to my watercolor brushes and just say, for example, we'll grab the old uh, cobalt violet. Now this is even something how we can even use a selection tool for blending purposes. So in other words, if I move this down, I want to center this up a little bit and it's a fairly small area. So, but we're still going to make use of it. If I put down my cobalt violet and just say, for example, this is any given shape, it's already blending, already mixing. But now if I go up here, hit my selection tool again, and then right here, invert selection. If I click on that, now the entire page is, is selected with the exception of this box. So now if I just say, for example, go to my blue, and if I put my blue down, it's going to go right up against that cobalt violet. And, and not too much is going to happen because the selection tool is pr protecting that violet. But watch what happens if I hit deselect. I'll go up here, and this right here is deselect all. If I hit deselect, now my blue starts running into my cobalt violet. So if I want to actually control a wash or when it starts to happen, I could use the, the selection tool to hold paint back until I'm ready to leave it release, and then it will release when, when I want it to. Now, that's just an option. Now, let's dry, let's fast dry that. We'll keep that the way it is. And then we'll go on to the other shapes. And it's the same thing with the ellipse. If I start drawing with the ellipse, I will get an ellipse any size I want. But then if I touch down and hold shift as I touch, then I'll get a perfect circle. And then again, if I make that circle over, over my given shape, hit enter I will select that particular area and then if I even go back with another color now uh, and then put that in then this would be uh, only that area is where I'll be painting uh, which is great this kind of reminds me personally of back in the airbrush days when you used to use a piece of tracing paper and and you would just put it down and keep moving uh, the the actual uh, paper and just keep on giving lines or a specific rep repetitious shape whatever you want to do you could keep on using that same hard edge so again if I hit the select I'll just hit control D on the keyboard or you could hit it up here uh, right here, this is the deselect right there. So if I hit that deselect, and then what will happen is I could go back and just go to a square again. And if I even uh, make just a line here, uh, a long, real long uh, rectangle, hit enter. Again, the same thing. If I go back to a deeper blue and I put a straight edge down, and then now if I hit my selection tool and then uh, actually move the selection and then I can actually even put another color down of the same value and then grab the selection move it again I grab another color if I want and now I'm, I'm just making straight edge lines so even if like say for example if you're rendering a city uh, or or any kind of repetitious blocks patterns uh, skyscrapers and you want to make repetitious lines just to give a rendering uh, this would be a pretty easy way to do it, uh, a pretty effective way also, because uh, all you're using is the straight edge and letting your paint blend, and then what you could do is you could actually start with a real light value of blues or grays or whatever color you want, and then keep getting darker and darker, and it'll also be making those buildings or blocks or whatever you're doing get closer and closer because they're getting darker and darker. Now, uh, if we go to the, uh, let's go to the polygon, now all that will be, is every time I touch down and lift up, I'm going to be able to put this dot, next dot, anywhere I want. So if I touch down here, 
then I will be able to move that dot anywhere I want. So this would be a straight edged shape, but it could be as many sides or as many uh, different uh, overall shapes as that I want. I touch here, touch here, touch here, and then if I touch back to the original point, then this would be my protected shape. And if I hit enter, then that is now my protected shape. So if I go back to any kind of color, then this would be the protected area. I'll fast dry that, and then we'll go back to the next one, which is the free hand. And the free hand is really nice that if you're working with some kind of irregular shape, then you could actually go back in and just quite literally freehand any shape you want and when you connect it back up it will connect and then if you hit enter that's the shape you want uh, and then you can move that all around also however you want and then uh, use it uh, to protect a specific area or just to paint in a, 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 just a pretty much an erratic shape of something that you may want also now that's the shapes we're going to save the magic wand for down below at the very end and then what we will do now is go into the actual uh, adding and subtracting uh, to the selection area itself. Okay, now adding or subtracting to a given selection area. Uh, just say, for example, we start off with the rectangle tool again. Now, if I make uh, just two different rectangles, uh, that one, and then now, since if I want to add to this one, then I would hit add to selection. Now, that selected area will stay there but then I could add another area to it. Just say for example like that, and I hit enter again, and now this two, two rectangles become my actual selected area. Now say for example, I needed a straight edge across here though. What I can actually do then is hit uh, subtract. Now I'm subtracting from that area, and then if I draw another real long rectangle, but then right here at the corners, if I see that little arrow, I could rotate it. I'll rotate it, put it in place, and wherever I want it or wherever I need it to rotate it at, just say from that upper corner right here down to anywhere I would need it, then if I hit enter, now I took that area away. So now I have a uh, revised uh, two rectangle areas, uh, total selected area. This would become my working area. So in other words, you can actually uh, use the add and subtract uh, from the selected area already given in a number of ways. Now again, if I wanna add to this for whatever reason, then I would just go to back to add selection and I can even add a circle or an ellipse if I want. And then if I do this and then hit enter again, then now it added that elliptical area to what was already there. Again, that's just add and subtracting to a given area. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which will be resizing a shape. We're going to size this down a little bit. We can use the uh, selection tool also to resize an area. Uh, this is probably best done in the earlier stages of your painting or drawing or whatever you're doing. Only because then keep in mind, if you have any specific textures involved or paint strokes involved, you're also going to be enlarging uh, or making them smaller. Uh, so just for example, I just did a, a quick uh, drop in of an image. Uh, this is uh, a early stage of those mushrooms that I painted in a demo a while back in Rebel 4. Uh, right here is the background that I put in. And, and I just wanted to show you real quickly, with or without a background, it's not going to matter, only because here's my mushrooms, and they're on their own separate layer. So now if the background was with the mushrooms and in the same layer, then I'd have a little bit more work to do. But then also, uh, it would be a little wee bit more challenging for that reason. Uh, but what I want to do is go to the mushrooms here, and then just say, for example, I want to make this mushroom a little bit bigger or smaller. Now, we'll make it bigger, and what I would do is just select that particular mushroom, and then I'm going to copy and paste it. I copied it, and now I pasted it, and then here it is right here. Now, if I turn it off, it's going to barely be noticeable because it's the exact same thing right on top of itself. So if I turn this off, now you'll see where the copy is. But now what I would do is then I would zoom in, and what I would do then is grab my eraser and we'll get a, uh, so we use the soft edge and I want the opacity obviously all the way up. And if I start 
painting around, so to speak. And I'm just cutting this out real fast, just to give you a real quick idea of what I would do in a situation like this. Because remember, again, it's going to all depend on what you're exactly doing. And then if I actually, uh, okay, I'll take it back down. And then if I uh, turn my mushrooms back on, now this is what I'll get, but if I stay on this uh, layer five, that is the copy pasted down version. Then if I go back to my move transform tool, I will immediately get uh, just nodes that I could resize it. So then if I take it up or down, if I take it down, then I may have to erase some of the original mushroom only because now it'll be seen behind my new piece. But if I take it bigger, then I won't have to pretty much do anything because it'll be covering up whatever's there. So now I could just resize it, move it into the place I want. And then now I have a new mushroom. And if I hit enter there or OK at the bottom, uh, then that would be a quick resize and that would be it. And that could be a, a, a applying to anything you do throughout your drawing, especially in your drawing stages. If you want to start freehand drawing and then you want to actually uh, rearrange some proportions or drawings that if you might have a little bit off, you could select a specific area and then enlarge it. Uh, make it smaller, move it around, whatever you need to do. And then when you set it back in place, you may have a little bit of re readjustments to do, but it will save you a lot of time by moving around or resizing what you already have. And then that's work you've already done that you don't have to do over again. Okay, let's go on to the magic wand. Okay, for the magic wand, all I did was take uh, the original mushrooms and copy and pasted them and move them into our magic wand area because we could then do this uh, actually uh, just how we uh, would uh, do uh, any uh, type of painting and the mushrooms right where they're at now is actually a good example of how we could do this. Uh, if I click on the selection tool and then select the magic wand then I'm going to start off at a real low tolerance at 10 uh, and so that's only going to pick up uh, colors that are very close to each other. So in other words, the, uh, the wide, wide range of values is not going to be that great. So now, for example, I have, I'm going to turn off contiguous and use alpha. And we're only going to use the anti-aliasing right now. And again, remember what it did in the fill bucket. It's just going to give you a softer edge of what you're picking, which depending on what you want to do, if you want a hard edge or a soft edge, then that's the one you would choose to turn on or off. Now, if you want to actually... Uh, just like say for example I want to select this cream color right here then what I did was because the contiguous is off it's going to select that same value throughout the entire painting and because it's on a tolerance of 10 it'll pick up values that are fairly close to that now if I turn it all the way down to zero and then do that again then it's going to be a smaller area you can see how busy uh, the selection area is that what it picked only because it's picking much uh, closer in value of what you exactly selected. So now if I uh, deselect that and try it again with the contiguous on, then what I'm going to do is wherever I touch, it's only going to pick that specific area. So in other words, if I have a value change down here at the bottom of this uh, mushroom, then it's not going to pick anything down in here. If I pick this right here, then now all of a sudden it's just on this mushroom uh, and that's it. Uh, so in other words, it's only going to pick a specific area of that value that you have the tolerance set at. And then if there's colors around it that, that break it from the same value in another area, it will not select that area. So now if I again turn that off, then what it'll do is select everything across the mushrooms that are that same value. So then again, it depends on what you want. Now, if I want to fine tune uh, that uh, particular selection, then I could just adjust the tolerance. If I go up to 20 and then uh, select that exact same area, I will unselect it first. And then if I select that now, it's selecting a little bit of a bigger area only because it's including more value in that selection. So if, if now that the things are a little bit lighter, darker, that are close to the exact pixel that you picked, then it's giving you that area too. So then what you could do is if you could really fine tune that, say for example, I wanted to get uh, this 
uh, burnt sienna value involved too. I could do one of two things, either mess with the tolerance or if I just hit uh, add to selection and then touch that color also, then now I'm also going to get that color too with it. So that depends on how you want to do it or how you want to adjust your selection that then you could see that now uh, just to see what we have selected, I'll go back to a brush and go back to red and I'll make it a little bit bigger and we'll just go over everything and you'll see that uh, now that would be the area that I had selected. Now if I invert that selection then obviously everything that doesn't have colors to it would actually then be the just exact opposite if I inverted the selection. But you can see that since I was pulling out the cream colors and uh, the little wee bit of the burnt sienna colors, it left this brown behind when I put the red over it. It left this darker raw umber and even a little bit of a sepia uh, that it did not select that area, so red did not go down in those areas. But if you want to add, like just you could see what it's doing here, and, and if, you, if I deselect then you can see that I'm, I'm, I'm adding red to a very specific area. So if you want to get a, a light orange or a light blue value to just specific areas of whatever you're doing, then that's a really good way to select that specific area and then go back over with a wash or what have you. But then you could even make the wash on its own separate layer and then that way you could decide whether you like it or not. Uh, let's go on to chapter 11. Okay, chapter 11 the transparency lock, or also known as the lock transparency right here. Uh, this is the tool we're gonna to be using in this chapter. Now this one has some pretty big advantages. Arguably it's my favorite tool. Uh, it, just what it does and how it does it, any program that has it, I definitely use it. Uh, but the, in this particular case, uh, we're gonna be able to use it a great deal. And that is, uh, just say for example, transparent lock, a wet layer. Now what I will do is I will zoom in again so we can see what we're doing. And then uh, I want to go to my water tool right here. Now if I put down, just we'll use the splatter. If I put down just a layer of water, that's all we'll see because we can't see anything. It's clear water. If I hit show wet area, now I can see what I did. But here's the difference. Now if I turn that off and then actually hit the uh, lock transparency which is right there the lock transparency is on now but if i go to just say for example a red color bright red so we could see it real easy we'll go to our watercolor brush uh, the bloom wet is fine if i start painting nothing's happening and the reason why is because it is considering the entire layer transparent so being that you have the transparency lock on it's not going to let you paint anywhere the only thing it'll let you paint on is a little bit of paint that's already there or started. So for that reason, if we do this, turn off the lock transparency, turn on the show wet area again, now put on the lock transparency, then we could even turn off the show wet area again if we want. So if we leave on the show wet area and before we turn it off, hit the lock transparency, now this is what happens. If I take that same red and go back over it, now all of a sudden I could go back over just the water area. I locked that area so I can't work anywhere else but where that water was. Now, this is just another option. That the reason why is if I put down a color first, that's fine, but then maybe I don't want that color in that entire area. And what I mean by that is if I put a clear wash of water down, I can, let me undo this, so now we know that our wet area is still there, but what happens if I want to just say, for example, uh, take an orange and then just go and blend it, but not all the way to the end, and leave a diffused end there, and then take a red back into it. And, and create a shape that doesn't include my total wet area. In other words, if I put a color down first, then that color is going to be everywhere. That is, if I just started with a color, whether or not I use transparent or lock or not, but this is starting with just water. And then if I hit the transparent lock, now I can put the color down where I want, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the entire wet area. Just another option to control your color. So now if we turn off the show wet area, I'll have a specific wash that'll gradate out to nothing, even though our wet area comes way out to here. 
Again, just another option. Okay, let's move on to controlling the mixing area. Okay, now we're going to control the mixing area. Now this gets a little bit interesting. And the reason why I say that is, remember what we did over here. We uh, showed the wet area, then hit the transparency lock. Then we could even turn off the show wet area. And that will give us that locked area only. But now what if we do it in the exact opposite way? And what I'll do is hide the show wet area, turn off the transparency lock. It doesn't matter anymore because we're going to a new layer. And what I will do is zoom in a little bit so we can see what we're doing. But now this is what we're going to do this time. If I show wet area, obviously nothing's wet on this, on this layer. But if I wet the entire layer, now turn off the show wet area. My layer is wet, but I have nothing locked transparent yet. But now watch what happens. If I actually let uh, the colors mix, I'll just say we'll go with the cobalt violet. Let me give a little bit more color here just so we could see it mixing. Because our layer is wet, as soon as I let go of the brush, this is going to start blending and bleeding out. I'll put a little bit of red in it just to see colors mix and maybe a little bit of blue. Colors don't matter at this point. We just want to see the technique. Now what's happening is because my layer is wet, a very wet paint is going to be bleeding out until I hit the lock transparency. Now it's going to stop right where it's at, but the colors within inside the paint are going to keep on mixing. So what I did was I stopped the area where I wanted it to, but then I'm also going to get a different effect only because when they stop mixing to the border, it's going to start rushing back in. So that's what it's actually doing right now. So for that reason, uh, the actual colors are going to react differently because I created an artificial border. Uh, but being that we did not turn on the lock transparency while the show wet area was showing the wet, then I was able to do this. Otherwise, I would not be able to paint on the layer again if I locked the entire area and then uh, would not be able to lock it. It would not stop it the way it did now. But now this, if I turn off the wet, the uh, lock transparency, it's going to start feathering out again. It'll start migrating out again because now it's it's going out even further. It'll be soon up into my text here pretty soon, but it's also creating a quite different pattern because you had colors mixing here differently and it's making more of like a finger effect versus just a smooth color uh, blending out. So again, just another way, another option of controlling your color. Let's go on to staying within your lines. Okay, let's move on to staying within your lines. And that is just exactly what it sounds like. But it makes working with smaller areas, small objects, uh, detail work, but trying to shade or change values within a small area, it works very well. And let's enlarge our area here just so we can see what we're doing. And this will work again with any object, any style. But for me, just like say, for example, I was drawing a branch of some kind. Um, let's see, we'll go with the, uh, the quinacridone gold and I will use just a soft brush and we'll take the opacity way down. And again, I would be working from my light colors to my dark. So uh, just any old branch here uh, that would be like this. And if I put these in different ways, because I have some water in it, it's going to uh, be any way, shape, or form. Because I have water to it, then what it'll do is it will blend and bleed together. And even though I have like start and stop marks like right there, that paint will bleed out and blend in a little bit better because I have water in it. If I didn't have any water in it, then I'd get overlap marks uh, where the actual brush strokes were overlapping each other. Okay, now say I just got this now. Uh, it, it is still mixing, that's okay. But then if I hit the lock transparency there, now what I could do is I could go back in and actually start shading if I want to. And then just say, maybe go with a raw umber. And if I go back on this backside, then I could start adding color to it. And then I have to watch that if I'm doing this, if I don't want it to blend and bleed the whole way across, 
then I would have to hit my fast dry and stop it right there. But then it's going to still be wet. Now I could shade this one however I want and leave it blend a little bit across and then shade this one however I want. But I don't have to worry about painting within my lines. I could have the brush go way out over the side and it doesn't matter. It's only going to go on exactly where I want it to be, which is very nice to do different things. If I want to shade this side, if I want to shade the bottom of this because it's an underneath side, I would have to determine what this brush is doing in space depending on what is low and what is high. But you get the idea that I could uh, shade it as much as I want. Then even if I want to go over another coat or if I want to start establishing grays, then what I could do is go to a blue and let the blue mix in with the raw umber and it's going to start creating grays. But what I could do is leave that mix for a while, and you can see it's it's kind of graying down, and then hit the fast dry and leave it like that. And then depending on where I want blues, uh, that's how I could actually shade it. But now depending on, for me, what kind of branch it was, it might have a very subtle, soft spot pattern to it. And this is where the transparent lock really works well. I could go to a different brush, uh, just say for example, uh, my sand brush, and I'll cut it way down. And if I want a soft spotted uh, pattern, then I would give it some water and let those spots bleed out a little bit. If I want a very specific hard dot pattern, then what I would do is actually turn the water completely off. So when that dot goes down, just like in previous chapters, when I put down a dry paint on a wet surface, it's still not going to move. It'll just stay right there. So depending on if I put a little bit of water in it, and I'll even zoom in a little bit more here. We're in pretty good right now. But then if I put, just say for example, a, a sepia dot on it, uh, and there are many trees that have dots on them, uh, like aspen trees, different things like that. If I put down like that, and then I could fast dry it right away. And then if I'll have a very strong texture throughout my entire branch, but it's only going to go down in the branch area because I have the transparency lock. If I do this here, then I could stop it. If I want it even a little bit darker, a little bit more pronounced, if I start putting it down a little bit more, I could stop it right away. And then this is the texture I'm going to get. It's going to be a very strong texture depending on what I want. If I turn the water down, now if I put it down, it's even going to be a stronger texture. And then fast dry that there. Just to leave everything else the way it is. And then this is just the way that I can actually uh, work on uh, just very specific areas because the reason why is if I'm starting to work with pattern brushes, I wouldn't want to try and take my sand brush and paint up to the edge and stop right at the edge. I don't have to do that. I could just go to town and work whatever area I want or whatever pattern I want and then fast dry it and then that's it. It will stay right where it's at, and it's giving me a very nice, interesting texture. But then if I want to, if I even want to little, add a little moss or whatever uh, to it, if I go to some kind of a green, then I can actually then uh, put it in a different area, a different place, and start adding some very subtle color changes to it. And that's what will start giving your object complexity, where you have very subtle color changes, very subtle patterns. And that would be uh, just staying within your lines. Now we'll move on to multicolor combinations. Okay, let's move on to the multicolor combinations. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually uh, use a reference image here. And what I will do is just go down and hit window. Uh, reference images right here. And when I click on that, I will get this window here. If I click on this to open it, here's my reference image here to get that. All you have to do is hit import new image and then go to wherever it's at on your system and then click on it, hit open, and this is what you will get. If I click on it now, I will get a separate window with just that photo in it. And this is so you could have uh, multiple reference images out if you need them. And I will open this up. And what we're going to do is make this bigger, but then we're going to close it down to just that butterfly bush which is this right here. And we're going to try and duplicate that in a spontaneous way using our lock transparency. Now I'm going to uh, move into right here. And then we will uh, start, we'll give ourselves some room. And let's give this a shot. 
Okay, the first thing I want to do is actually uh, show wet area because I'm going to lay down uh, just a clear water, but I'm going to put down a specific pattern to duplicate this flower and I want to see where I'm putting down the water. So let's go to our water tool and we're going to use this splatter right here. And then since I have the show wet area on, I'm going to put down a pattern that's going to try and duplicate that flower okay that don't look too bad and what I will then do is before uh, I turn this off but in this case I would leave it on anyway I will hit the lock transparency and the reason why is I just want to see what area I'm working with uh, before as soon as I put down the first uh, layer of color then I'll be able to turn it off if I want to then I already know where I'm working now this color definitely has my permanent magenta and my dioxazine purple in it so that's what we will start off with and I'm going to turn the water all the way up and then the opacity we'll leave it right there and we definitely have to make the brush oh we're going to go to a different brush that's why we're going to go with the spots wet and that is now we're going to turn the opacity down after I turn it up and then we're going to leave the water all the way up we're going to leave it mixed hard so now what we're going to do is put down our purple and then we will go straight to the uh, dioxazine purple but then what we will do is turn off the show wet and I want to get some of those colors in there pretty good and then just like over in here I could put the quinacridone gold and then also then the burnt sienna let those bleed a little bit but then you can see these are moving now and what I have to watch is, as soon as I want to fast dry it, I'm going to leave it bleed out a little bit. But then I'll even go with the cobalt blue. And I'm going to turn the opacity all the way up. And then once I put these down, I'm going to leave them bubble out. And as soon as they start creating white dots for me, then that's when I'm going to stop it. fast dry and last coat there's what I'm looking for stop now I have some kind of a texture there but now just for example if I wanted to use this as just an example of some of my flowers I have some interesting things going on that the watercolor did for me or I should say the water and it gave me some lighter areas just like right in here some lighter areas to start with this would be my base coat then I could go back in and put them little deep orange dots in if I wanted to or, or anything else like that but one last thing to show you real quick since we just went through the selection tool not too far back now what I would do is actually go to my selection tool hit the magic wand and actually uh, I would turn off the transparency lock so I could work on any area now but then if I actually select uh, we it will show you the difference again just to be sure the contiguous is on if I select the transparent area now it's going to select all the transparent area but it did not select everything that's because some of these areas are closed off so if I do the exact same thing I'll deselect and then take the contiguous off now if I uh, select the uh, transparent area now it's selecting everything that's completely transparent and the reason why I would want to do that is because now if I went to a script brush nice fine detail brush I could start off with this even like a sap green or anything along that line and start putting in my stem wherever I want it to be that would only be in the protected areas of where I have it selected off so it's not going to affect my purple because no matter how transparent my purple is uh, it's still opaque flower that should be covering up the stem so if I protect those areas then I could go back in and put my stem anywhere I want it or even just uh, separate branches if I make this smaller then I could go back with separate branches and start working anywhere I want uh, just to actually uh, work in areas that are completely protected then I could go back in and and put in the details I want but in a carefree relaxed kind of way that I could be free 
and make uh, very interesting shapes, but not worry about having to paint around any little last bit of purple. And this will just give you a rough idea. Then once I was done, I think if I would do something like this uh, in more of a detailed way, I would definitely like a pattern like this to be looser and spontaneous. But what I think I would do is, is more of a very light first wash coat to just kind of like represent that entire shape of purples uh, and a little bit of blue and then leave that very light like almost like up in here at the top real light and then go back in with these deeper colors on a separate layer so it does not affect what I already put down and then that way I could build a little bit more depth to that flower instead of just having wide open spaces then they would actually be uh, more along these colors with the real deep purples uh, with the bubbled shapes on them uh, in front of those. And then I could even put my stems in between them because I can make the stems dark enough to cover up this layer because they would be on the back side of the flower. So the stems would be in front and then, but still leave them behind my deeper purples, which would be the front flowers. And that's just a, an interesting way of creating depth to a flower. Because after all, you have flowers on the back side of the flower a stem in the middle, and then flowers on the front side of the flower. That's it. Now we'll move on to chapter 12. Okay, chapter 12, the masking layer, whether it be opaque or transparent, the area that you're protecting. Now this one could get a little bit complicated if you want it to be, but what you could do with different stages of protecting specific areas uh, works really well if you just think about what you want to try and do. Now, what I mean by that is I went ahead just to try and save us some time and I selected this moss down here, the lichen, and all I did was use the magic wand and adjusted the tolerance and just kept adding to what I had. Now, I wasn't worried about being critical. I just want to show you different things here. And what I want to do is if I actually, now that I have that area selected, I want to fill it in with a solid color. Because just remember, with this masking system, you can have more than one mask, but you can only use one mask at a time. And that's mask, not selected area or not uh, transparent lock area. So this is where it's going to get a little bit complicated. So now that I have uh, this area selected of our original photo, we're just going to use this photo so I don't even have to do out a drawing here just to save us some time again. And what I'll do is I will actually make a new layer. We'll just call it red. Okay, and then now I will go ahead and fill this in with red. Uh, let's go to a solid brush. And then uh, I don't want no water. I want opacity all the way up to 100. Uh, and then we'll go with red. And then we'll just fill it all in. Whatever selected. I wasn't worried about being too critical with the selected area because this is more of just to show you what you could do uh, with this particular uh masking system which is great now i could deselect that and now i have that as a layer so this is my red layer here and now i can always use that to redo that now here is what we could do first uh, i want to fill in the blue just to say a couple of things about the fill bucket again i i just went ahead and went around the outline of that blue i'll zoom in just a little bit just to give us something to look at here because this is kind of critical when you want to fill in uh, to a specific value of blue. And what I mean by that is I will go back to my cerulean blue and then uh, go to my fill bucket. And this will save time instead of trying to cover the whole thing just by hand. I just went ahead and did a nice outline. Uh, make sure it's, it's nice and clean however I want the outer edge, the outer perimeter. And then now if I have the fill bucket on, and if I put it, uh, just say for example, uh, it could be anything, it could be about, uh, let's just go with uh, 254, or no, more importantly, 255, and here's why. 255, that is the entire layer. So if I select a blue now, if I touch it, it's going to fill in the entire layer. So oddly enough, if I put contiguous on, but then just make this 254, this is what will happen. Just fill in the blue. But it did a really good job at 254 of filling in the blue exactly. There is no daylight. 
So if I would actually undo that and then uh, put it all the way down to just say, for example, 20, then here's what's going to happen. I'm, I may very well have some daylight that it didn't select uh, for just not because it's such a low tolerance. And for whatever reason, I'm not concerned about that. I just want to fill it in completely. So what I will do is actually uh, just uh, undo that and then put it back up to 254 and then touch it again. And I know now it's completely filled in, no daylight showing through my mask area. Now, these are the two different mask areas we could use, and you'll see why uh, when we get started here. Uh, and we're going to first give it a light coat of uh, gray, real light coat. We're going to duplicate this gray right here, and then we're going to mark these areas off so they're protected, and then go with darker grays around it. But the whole time, our blue will be uh, protected. And then later on, if we want to do this area over here, we could reselect this area now since it's already a very solid color, very easy to select, and then work on these areas over here, make them darker than what the lichen is. So for that reason, we'll then protect that area and the blue will still be protected. Let's give this a shot. Okay, now the first thing I need to do is make the cerulean blue area my mask. And the reason why is I want to keep this area uh, nice and clean. Uh, when I put down the real light yellows, real light oranges and reds, then I don't want that area contaminated with any of the deeper, darker colors that will be behind it. So, uh, what I am going to do is make this the masking area. And since I want to protect the leaf, once I click on the M right here to make it a masking layer, then I want to protect the opaque for now. So if I click on mask opaque, it's going to make all my other layers influenced. But then right now, so far, I'm only protecting that blue. Now the red, I could turn it off. We don't need it for now. And then what I will also do is make a new layer. And we'll just leave it just called layer one. What I'm going to do next is create this uh, real light cobalt turquoise gray here. That's this color here. So again, working with traditional watercolors, we're going to start with our lightest colors and then work dark. But what I'll do is pr uh, first put down the coat of this gray that's where we have to start and I will actually turn on I will turn off that uh, a photo but remember I have to make this an influence layer so it does work with the mask that's an influence layer now and then keep in mind I can even turn the mask off completely even though that layer is off completely it still will do its job as the mask so again, if I go now to my watercolor brush and put that real light coat of cobalt turquoise gray down, I uh, will just use this mop. We can even wet the layer and then we can verify that it is wet. And there is, uh, was my leaf and it is even protecting it from wetting the layer, uh, which is fine. Uh, I'm going to stay with the mop. We're going to start with uh, raw umber first and I'll even make this a four. And then we're going to give it a real light wash. You'll see the leaf come up right there it is. But this is a very light wash. And that's only because this is the lighter color that we need. And then I'm going to put my cobalt turquoise over that. And it's going to get like a grayish cobalt turquoise color. And over in here, as long as I take it past half the leaf, that's all I need because from right in here over is going to be very dark. So it doesn't matter. I can do this later and redo that. But there's going to be so many layers of paint over it. It's going to be well covered. Now that I have that down, I will fast dry that just to set it where it's at. And I could uh, bring my leaf back. There it is. I could also bring my photo back because this is what we're going to do next. Uh, now I could do this on a new layer or just leave it on the same layer. That really doesn't matter. But what I need to do next is now I will select these areas. I'll go up to my freehand selection tool. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to do this real fast, real time. And I'm just going to go around these areas. And I'm going to select these areas. And then I have to add. So I want to hit add because I'm going to make another new shape. And I'll keep the shape I already made. There's another one. Then we'll put one or two more. 
just so you get a rough idea what I'm doing and why. Okay, there's another one. We'll do this one one last time. Just a real quick outline. Okay, and there's that. Now I could turn off my photograph. It would be our guide, so to speak. And then now if I take it back out, now what I could do is, is I don't want to paint within these areas because right now the area I have selected, that's the only area I would be able to paint in. Well, I want to paint in the opposite area. So again, I have to hit invert selection. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to hit invert selection, which is right there. And now everything is selected with the exception of these areas here. So those areas now will be protected. And then keep in mind, uh, my leaf is still protected because the mask layer over supersedes everything. Whether you use transparent lock, whether you use the selection tool, no matter what you're using, the masking area will come first, providing it's an influence layer. So now I could go a little bit darker. If I turn on my photograph, I could go that deeper greenish gray and then start working over here. But now see from here over to here, this is real dark. So if I take my lighter colors over to in here, that's all I would need to do. Uh, what now I will turn off the photograph and then we'll go back to those same colors and we'll just go a little bit darker and you'll see what I'm up to. Uh, we'll go a little wee bit darker and I'll keep that same mop. But then now if I go back over this, And then that now the leaf is still protected, obviously, because it's an influence labor. But then I also now blocked out those lighter areas that I could keep lighter and then go back in later and work detail. I'll put a little wee bit more. Well, actually, let's go with a different value. Maybe that Terra Verde. We'll just make it a little wee bit of a greenish uh, gray just to change it up a little bit. And then now if I deselect... Well, first, we can put our photograph back on, and then you'll see why I did that. Now it's darker over here, and if I deselect, uh, then uh, what I'll do is uh, be able to paint anywhere again. But now, uh, first I want to fast dry so this doesn't blend anymore. I can make my blend tool, and then just kind of blend that out a little bit. That's good. And we're not worried about the top because that's, uh, would be off the picture anyway, but now what I have started here is just the the shapes that I would go back in and refine if I turn my photograph back on Now the next thing I could do is actually work with these dark areas even on a separate layer But if I still want to protect my leaf Then that's the same thing I could do. Let's make one more layer uh, we will do that just here. We'll just uh, that will be fine. Just layer two But then now since I have my photograph up I will deselect everything and I'll go back to my freehand tool Selection tool and then what I could do is actually draw around these areas now And I could go right over my leaf it won't matter and Then now what I'll do is all the dark area and now since I want to do the dark area that I am selecting, then I won't have to actually uh, invert the selection because this is the area I want to paint. Uh, and then what I can also do, just say for example that light area right there, if I go back to subtract, I could take that little area out and it will remain light. Now that that's selected, then what I will do is turn off my photograph and let's go, uh, we want to keep it, that leaf protected, so we have to make it an influence layer. Now if I go back to my darker colors, even more darker, I'll go back to, just to give you a rough idea of what we're doing here, uh, then I could go back to the uh, raw umber, and if I put a layer down now, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to protect my leaf, but then uh, now I could start making textures in, in there, if I go to my bloom uh, and then go with the blue and then let those mix together, uh, that's a little bit too dark. I'm going to undo that. I'm going to cut back the opacity a little bit. And then if I leave those blend in and let them create some textures, because there is a lot of texture in that bark, 
And then just say, for example, I'll fast dry that for now. And then turn on my photograph. And then this is what I was trying to darken. Uh, all these dark areas in here. But then again, now what I could do is since I have that red, it doesn't even matter if I paint over that red. Because now if I have that red, I will deselect. Okay, now that I have nothing selected, what I will do is I'll just show you a little up close here. And, and because I took the time to make that red also, I could go back to that layer, turn it on, and then touch that layer. And if I go to my magic wand, then I will actually, uh, I don't want to subtract. I just want uh, just the uh, actual magic wand and just select that. And now I just selected all of the red, all of it, because I have the contiguous off. So I'm going to get all of the red value and that's it, whether it's touching or not. But now that I have that selected, I could go back, I could turn that off and then go back to whatever layer I was just working on and grab my eraser and erase all that out. So now I'm definitely back to just paper if I turn off the photo. I could just erase all this out and even though I put the darker grays, the darker blues down over top of my lichen, it doesn't matter. Once I have that red down and it's made uh, that I could then always uh, go back and either erase what's uh, behind it or go to that layer or anything I need to do. But then I can also make that a mask layer if I want to. If I want to then start painting in here and then protect my leaf, I could do the same thing. I could go back to the leaf area, turn it on, and then use my magic wand. If I make the red the mask area, which I easily could, if I go back up to the red area, turn it on, and now I make it the mask area, I'll take this off and then to just make this an influence layer once I take the red and make it the red masking opaque, then I could then, now this would be protected even if I deselect it. And then now the blue, uh, I can also protect it again just by going to the magic wand and going back to the blue layer, selecting it, and now the entire leaf is selected and then now it could be protected depending on whether I invert or actually just leave it the way it is, depending on where I want to paint. So for now, uh, there is a, a keep in mind, we didn't even use transparent lock. So that would be next. In other words, if I only wanted to work on this area right here, the dark browns I just put in, because they're on their own layer, if I make the transparent lock on that layer now, then now I would only be able to work on that layer. If I make the blue back to the mask again and mask opaque and then turn this one off and just make it an uh, influence layer. We can even make that one influenced. Oh, we got to make that in the mask again and then leave that one influenced. Uh, and then now the cerulean blue area would be protected. But if I want to go to the browns and the blues, the dark browns, if I go back to that now that it's actually a transparent lock, I'll turn off my blue so you can see what happens. And because I have the transparent lock on now, same thing. It's still going to work the same way the selection tool works. If I go back to a brush and even just uh, go back to, let's see, watercolor. Uh, we'll just leave that there just to show you. And I will deselect everything. But now because this is an influence layer with the transparent lock on, it's going to go by the mask. And then I even have the mask turned off. But if I start putting, and I'll just put a different color down so you can see. Uh, we'll put down the sepia. Well, no, let's go with uh, a red. Uh, and then if I put red down, I'm only going to be able to put red in that area that was dark before. Because I have a transparent lock on now. So you could use quite a few different combinations. And that's why when I put these chapters together... It was really tough for me to figure out which ones to put first or second. The only reason why is in the end, you're going to be using them all together. And the more you use it once, the more complicated uh, your watercolor could get. So because I still have the cerulean blue as the masking layer opaque, it's going to actually uh, then just still protect just the leaf area. So now if I make the cerulean blue, if I take it and make it the transparent area, 
then what I would do is uh, go back up here and make it the transparent area. And then now that it's going to protect everything transparent except the blue. So in other words, whatever I was make blue first, this is what's considered the opaque area. Even though I have paint everywhere else, the masking layer that I call now transparent is going to consider everything else transparent. So if I leave it on transparent, then that means the only thing I would be able to paint is within the blue. So if I do that now, uh, what I will do is create a new layer just to show you, and we will make it an influence layer. And then uh, I can even turn it off uh, because we'll see what we're painting. So now if I take any kind of textured brush and go with a yellow first, I'm only going to be able to paint within that leaf, and that's it. And then if I take my oranges, let them blend in, whatever, I could obviously get much more detailed than this if I wanted to or had the time. But if I make the brush a lot smaller, go with a red, uh, and then just put red in here and there, let those blend in. But point being is now I'm only able to work within the leaf and everything else is protected. By all means, if you have any questions about this, please ask below, because this one can get pretty complicated. With that, let's move on to chapter 13. Okay, chapter 13, drips. Uh, now, what this will be is we're going to be going into all kinds of different types of drips and what we could do with them. Uh, quite a few things, actually, uh, just even with a typical drip. Uh, right now, what I will do is uh, go first to the visual settings, and that is just right here. We'll need these two open. Uh, the tilt, which is right here. And then also the uh, visual settings, which is right here. And that's right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to have create drips on. And then we're just going to leave it 5 and 5 for now. Now, just a quick uh, basic hint. And that is uh, try maybe consider keeping your drips actual life size. So in other words, if you start... Uh, changing DPIs and paper sizes, then you may also want to work with your drip size on your visual settings. Because in other words, I don't think you'd want a drip on a painting uh, that would be a half inch or one inch wide. It's not going to look uh, very realistic or believable. So if you could actually consider the size of a water droplet sitting on paper and then it running down, it is going to be a very specific size and proportion to whatever you're doing. The bigger the paper, the smaller the drip and run. Okay, uh, now uh, let's go to this. Uh, we will leave them five and five and create drips are on. And now uh, if I turn this on and then make my line straight up and down for now, the uh, line is pretty much just what would be considered the angle of the paper. The longer the line, the steeper the angle of the paper. But then you could just look at it as the longer the line, the faster it'll run. Uh, I'll keep it on uh, maximum the whole time for all these just so we could get to the point as fast as possible. Now, first, we'll start off with uh, the, I'll go to my watercolor brush, and we're going to zoom in uh, on just a, just a regular dry paper drips, and we'll give ourselves some room here again. And then what we will do is we can go with the bloom wet, and we uh, will start with layer one. We have it just straight up and down and maximum speed, and then I have the visual settings five and five. And we're going to start off with, uh, uh, let's go with something, uh, this, even uh, the French ultramarine blue. I can make it a little bit bigger. Now, the amount of water you have in the paint obviously makes a difference on uh, how fast it runs, or maybe not even runs at all. Uh, so now we'll put down some blue, and then I'm going to put in some permanent magenta, just to have some color there. Let them blend together, and then once they start, we'll see the runs. And this will be just typical runs on, on dry paper. But then you can see it's starting to run. But then once it breaks free, that is about as close to a lifelike drip as you could get. But then what we're going to talk about later, though, too, is how all of our color is draining out. Now, here starts the, the runs now. And those don't look too bad a size. And then once they start running, you can even see how they even go into each other. And I'll let them run past even my next demo down below because we could just turn this layer off. We'll let it see. Now, this is what we're going to talk about later, about how we're making really nice runs. But keep in mind our original shape 
and all our color is draining out. So we're going to do something a little bit different with that too. Now I'm going to hit fast dry, which it shows right up here. And then I will move down and you could see uh, how much our drips have moved and run. But then you could see what ori uh, originally happened uh, to our colors that they all just kind of drained out. But that's just on dry paper. Let's move to multi-angle drips, which is nothing more than moving our uh, bar. Uh, I'm going to, again, uh, zoom in a little bit so we can see. And then we'll go to a different layer here. And we'll go to layer 2. And I'll leave this maximum. But then I'll do the same thing. Let's go with uh, even the cobalt violet this time. And then the uh, let's go with red. Maybe a little bit of orange. Colors don't matter. We're just working with uh, the drips themselves. And then now, once I flooded it pretty good, so once it starts running here, and I'll even move it up just so we can see just the drips. And as soon as they break free, uh, we'll see what happens with the drips. Here comes a couple now. And then what I wanted to show you is keep in mind, while they're dripping, while they're running, I can actually change the angle of them. And, and get a little bit experimental there, go back the opposite direction, and they will react to wherever this bar is. And then if I want to take it the whole way up the opposite direction, then this is the effect I'll get. But, but what I am saying is you can actually change the directions of the drips as they're dripping. And then if I go back down, then it'll start flooding down again. But you can see it stopped the flooding. Now it's going to all start flooding down again. But we're going to do something with that a little bit later in one of these same uh, uh, chapter uh, quick demos. Now if I just hit fast dry, that's where everything would stay. If I set it up, now this is what I got for this effect. But then now we'll go on to water tool diffused. I will turn these off just so they don't interfere with us. I'll go to layer three. I'll leave everything over here on the tilt as it is. And then I will go to water tool diffused. And this is how we're going to do something a little bit different. And that is, uh, we'll go back to our colors. And let's see, we can even get a different brush if we want to. Uh, but uh, we'll go with... Uh, the blue again. Oh, let's go with dioxazine purple. And then we'll put a little bit of, uh, just say orange in that. Just to get some kind of colors. Cobalt violet. And I'm really flooding the colors and the water. Just to get it to run fast so you can see what I'm up to. But then we're going to take this way off. So we just work with the drips. But then now what I'm going to do is go to the water tool. And I'll pick this and I want to have the water maxed. And then once it starts dripping, you got to be patient because once I move the page, it stopped everything for a while. That's the same thing when you paint. As you're painting, nothing's going to happen. As soon as you lift your pen, then it's going to start changing and start mixing and, and, and doing its thing. Here comes the drips pretty soon now. They should be happening here. I slowed everything down when I actually moved the paper. Here comes one drip now. Here they come. But now what I will do now is as they are dripping, this is a nice smooth drip. But if I show wet, then here is all my wet areas where my drips are going to start. Here comes a big one right now here. Here comes another one. You can see when they start and what happens, which is really neat. But now if I put my water tool down and just do this here and there, What's going to happen is it's going to diffuse these edges and then the, the color is going to start going out in a horizontal way. That, that is where I diffused it and it will change the direction of the color in a way that it's going to start changing the shape and the, uh, the subtle textures of the uh, actual drips. You can see what I did here. And if I do the same thing here or up in here, it's going to change where drips maybe even possibly start, or then also uh, what they look like after I'm done. So you can see these are completely different than the ones up above. These have multiple things going on within each drip. And then what you're doing is where uh, these colors stop is where it's running into a very small area of dry paper that it, then it'll go around it and create a new shape for you. 
But if I like what's going on over here or anywhere in here, and if I'm okay with everything, again, then just hit the fast dry, and that's it. That's what you'll have for good. Now, that is actually just water tool diffused. Now, what we'll do is a wet layer diffuse, which is a little bit the same of what we just did, but even uh, more as far as if I go to wet layer diffuse. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll go to layer four. But this time I'm going to wet the entire layer. If I wet the layer, I could verify that our layer is wet. But now if I go to the same thing, I'll turn this off because we already know the whole paper is wet, that layer. But then now if I go to my watercolor brush and then select any kind of colors, uh, let's go with uh, even cobalt turquoise. If I put that down, everything's going to happen. It's going to blend out in different ways, but it's also going to bleed. But then now our drips are going to be very soft because they're going to be diffused. So we'll let it do its thing. But now because the paper is wet, our drips are going to have a little bit of a different look to them. As soon as they break free, I can even change brushes, get a little wee bit more. Let's put down some burnt sienna. Now you can see what that did right away. It's right now running in a very nice clip and blending really well all the colors. There's a drip there. Now you'll be able to see what's going on. But when it starts to drip now, what will happen is it'll be a very diffused drip. It'll also start spreading out. Now it may not drip as much only because the paper's wet and you're going to have a lot of things going on. So it would almost be more of a run uh, versus a drip. But we'll still get drips. You got to be patient. But you can see now right in here, right in here, right in here, all the drips are actually diffusing out. And as they finally break free, it's very interesting the way this happens, uh, then you're going to get a different type of drip. But keep in mind, that's what we're going to work on here too soon. I'll fast dry that, center it up, and then here's what we have. But you can see how much our shape migrated down, and that's what we're going to work with also. And then this one is very different. Uh, with the water tool of how you get little jagged edges, little wee different uh, angles of paint going in different directions. And uh, that is uh, something that we could definitely, uh, how would you say, uh, work with. And, uh, and then again, if you even save these layers as a PNG or however you want, then you could even import them into another painting. And then that way you can actually... Uh, pick and choose again using your transform tool to size it up or place that drip right where you want it because as it moves down uh, it may be changing the location you want it at so if it's on its own layer then you could easily move it around back to where you need it to be let's go on to chapter 14 okay chapter 14 uh this is still drips but these are going to be a little bit more advanced and what we'll do is go back to our old friend the transparency lock or just the lock transparency. Now, the first thing I'll do is actually turn on my tilt all the way down just so we can see things happen quick. And we'll stay with the uh, Bloom Wet Brush. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. And we'll keep the opacity fairly light because I'll show you why. And we're gonna also start off with lighter colors. And we'll leave it about right there. Uh, just to give us some room, we're going to put the paint down in a hurry, but then we're going to go back out uh, just so we can see all the runs happening. I'll start off with yellow. Then maybe go to an orange. Let these all drip together. And even uh, just cobalt violet. Okay, now I'm going to go back out and just so we can work with the drips, but we'll work with them up close. And soon as they start dripping, you'll see what I'm going to be up to. So right now, while I'm waiting for them to drip, I'm going to actually go to a different brush. We'll go with the 
uh, even the sand brush, anything we could pick up a different type of a texture. And now as soon as they start dripping, we have to be patient. Here comes one. We're going to wait for a couple. And as soon as they start breaking free, if I put the water show wet on, you'll see where it'll pop open. And when they start dripping, here comes a couple now. Here, here comes another one right there. Here comes one. And then there's one, and it kind of just bursts and it breaks. And it's interesting as heck the way this happens. But then now we'll turn off the show wet. We'll leave some drip. And then you can even see how this right here is going to follow that wet area. Here's a couple more here. But now what I could do is actually hit the transparent lock. And just like we've done in the past, that's going to freeze everything right where it's at. And it will only protect that print the footprint of where the paint is right now but then just say for example I could go back in with a blue now that I stopped everything moving and I'm gonna put water in it I even have time to do that and now I could put some blues in that area and they're gonna keep on mixing as soon as I take the transparent lock off they're going to start uh, uh, lengthening again they'll start moving down again but what I did was I gave myself the opportunity to change colors inside the drips. Just like, say, for example, if I had some, uh, some real deep reds or something splashed around up on top, and I wanted to put those same reds in the drips for color unity and to let the uh, viewer uh, just bounce around a little bit with those same colors, then I could do that with the drips themselves. Then you could see how it actually also changed those particular drips too, that because I introduced a second color and more water inside the drip then it kind of like went together that it always goes out to the outer edge and then starts moving back which is really interesting and then that's going to create different drips uh, within that same run now if we like what we see now I'll pan out and then I'll just hit fast dry and we'll keep everything right there and you can even see I put it on a transparency layer and and what we did was we even add our letters uh, uh, bleed a little bit and that is going to be a spoiler for what's coming next in chapter 15 but we'll leave that go and leave that like that now the multi-layer advanced strips what we could do with that is see how this right in here this is nice, but all of our color drained out. So for that reason, uh, if we wanted a specific shape there to make it look like it is still a specific shape and it didn't migrate at all, but it is running, that's what we would have to do in multiple layers. And I'll show you that right now. Okay, now with the advanced drips, I will zoom in. Well, let, let's first show you real quick. the uh, What I want to avoid is this right here. Now, our overall shape that we started with is just about completely gone. But that should be expected because all that paint ran down the paper and created drips. So that's where all your color is going. But if you want to maintain uh, a specific opacity of your original shape, then you may have to do it on two layers. And here's how we'll do that. We'll center this up. And just say, for example, we'll just use a circle. And we will take the circle right here and we will draw the perfect circle and I will enter that and then here's what we're going to use as our guide and we'll start on layer one I have the tilt all the way to the max just straight down and if I actually uh, start with uh, let's go back to our watercolor brush we'll stay with the bloom wet and I'm going to use lighter colors again no big deal here and what I will do is actually just uh, first, I could turn the tilt down a little bit because I don't need it moving real fast that much. But we could adjust that as we go. And I just want just movement just like that. And now that I, I am starting to get some movement, what I could do is uh, fast drive that so it just stays there. And then I'll go to the next layer, use the same colors. And what I will grab is yellow first, put it down and then put the orange down and then hit control D and deselect my circle and let it run we'll put it on max and here they start and we'll let them run 
drips are going great so far. I'll just leave them go. Won't won't mess with anything. And just so until we get enough drips, that should be good. Just to get the idea how fast dry it there. But now here's the difference. If I go back and turn off layer one, that's what we get. Our shape is just about gone. But if I turn on layer one where we started, now we have enough left. But if, say for example, I don't want that hard round edge there, that would be up to you. Because we could always go back to that and zoom in and then go to our eraser tool. Uh, we'll go to the eraser tool and then I can even get just a soft and I'll turn it down. But then we want the opacity way down because we're only going to take a little bit at a time. And now that I'm on this layer here I could slowly get rid of that edge if I want to right where the drips start if I don't want that edge now if you want your overall shape left intact and you just want it to look like it's just starting the drip that's all up to you that would actually be where it's at in the dripping if it's just starting or if it's been dripping for a while and and if I slowly because I'm using the same colors then I could slowly destroy that hard edge if I want to and make it look like uh, it's dripping and the bottom of the circle is gone and then that's it now if I center it up again this is what I'll have but this is what it looks like without this layer and then this is what it looks like and let me zoom in a little bit this is what it looks like without this layer no drips at all but then this is what it looks like without our first layer that we left paint intact. So what I did was I just used the same colors to create our circle and then left them there and then just put the exact same colors over top of those on the next layer and left them drip because now all of our colors completely drained out of that circle. And without this, then we would definitely be losing uh, what original shape we had. That's it. Let's move on to chapter 15. Okay, chapter 15, this is photo drips. This is going to get a little bit more complicated also. This could even work into uh, the photographers or even anybody that just wants to work uh, with a photograph and add it either uh, as your total finished piece or even work it in with paintings, however you want to do this. Now, what we're going to do is I have the artistic photography down. This is the uh, logo I use uh, at the bottom of all my uh, canvas prints and the reason why I did that is some of my uh, intros to some of the demos this is what I used and this is what I did so now what I'll do is if I go to this uh, right here this layer here which is this right here and then if I turn it on if I put it there but here's the thing this is a PNG uh, or it could be a JPEG or a bitmap if it's a photograph now, if I go to my water tool, and I can even pick out a texture, I have my tilt on all the way just to show us right away. If I turn on my wet, nothing is wet so far. But if I actually, well, I can even wet the layer. Now the entire layer is wet. But now, if I start putting down water, this is what's going to happen to my photograph. Now this is text, this is cut out, so it's actually uh, just a cut out, and it's going to start running. And now what it's doing is it's actually making the print drip and run. So it's going to, for lack of better words, warp it out of shape, make it look like it's uh, drips and runs, and it will, it will definitely distort my, my photograph, or in this point, uh, text. And it's going to uh, uh, do an interesting job, actually. But now if it warps it out too much, then what we could do is just the same thing what we're going to do down below. And that's what we did before with the uh, multi-layer drips. And that is if, if, if things start to get too light in your text and you actually get to the point where you can't read it anymore... Then what you could do is what we'll do below it. And this is bleeding pretty good right now. And you can see if it gets to the point 
especially if you're trying to do this with text and you want it to the point where it's still legible though then leave it blend or bleed like crazy but then what we'll do is we will fast dry that and go to the next one and that would be these two right here now what I do is I have one right on top of the other so I could do one or the other it doesn't matter and if I need to flip flop the layers that would be no problem at all but I will do the same thing this time I will just use uh, right here the base uh, and it, well, let's do the top first and then what we could do is put a bunch of water on top of it and this time it might be a little bit different because I didn't wet the uh, layer itself and there it goes we'll get it moving and we'll just be patient and let it go Here's my wet areas right here if I show wet. There's the wet. I still have some texture in there, but now these are already starting to run. Some of the yellow. We're getting a little bit of runs here. And again, keep in mind, just like I mentioned in the past, where I first or originally showed you that very first mix, uh, that was four minutes. Uh, that I, I actually edited it down to only 10 seconds. I just speeded it up a little bit. Now this is going the same thing. But now this is the top layer. So if I can't read this, or if, if I think that it's it's a little bit too, too warped out of shape, that it becomes illegible if it's text, then what I will do is actually go ahead and uh, I'll just fast dry that. But now this is the base layer. Now it's not going to show up very good because it's underneath this layer. So if I move it to the top, now all of a sudden what I could do then is use either, either work on the base layer or flip flop them back and forth depending on how radical you want it to be for lack of better words. But then I could even take down this uh, opacity to anywhere I want it so it's still legible. But then it also looks like it, it completely melted or ran or dripped or did whatever it wanted. And then that way it'll look kind of like, uh, just kind of like melted in place for, for any other description I could think of. And then also just running, you could see where the, the, uh, the Tom Gelovich just kind of just drifted down. But then if I want it still legible, then what I could do is put a good copy of the exact same thing of the original back over it. And then if you want to get creative, then I could even put water to this one and leave it diffuse a little bit, but then just fast dry it right away. And that's it. Now we got, uh, with that in mind, with working with layers with photographs, we've got one last one to show you, and we will do that right now. Okay, I fast dried that. And then I'll just turn these off for now. I'll turn this one off, this one off, and then this one also. And we'll just go with this. I can even turn off the text for this next one. Because here's what we're going to do next. I'll turn this one on and this one on. And now what happened was I turned on the layer on top of it. But since it's the exact same thing, then you won't be able to tell the difference. But if I turn this one off, now you'll see what I cut out. I cut out just the lantern. And this could be for the photographers who want to experiment. But then the reason why is if I cut out the lantern and then turn this one back on, you can't see any difference at all. But if I go to the top layer that's just a cutout and add water to it, then just my lantern is going to bleed down. And that will control what part I want it to bleed. If I start putting water all over just the picture, then it's going to actually just start distorting the picture. And then you got, might be, have to be careful a little bit that if it starts distorting everything or if I uh, even wet the layer and leave it run around and move around a little bit, just like real watercolors will do, you could do the same thing with a photograph, but then it might just start to blur your image and might not really look like a painting. So if I want to just get a specific effect, then what I would do is go to uh, this layer right here, and we're working on this layer, which is just the lamp cut out, 
and I'll put this back just to show you, but then if I start adding water to this, now what we could do first is duplicate this layer just in case we need it, just like the second layer of text. I'll go down here, duplicate that, and we'll keep that there just, just in case, and then I will actually work on the top layer of that one. But then if I add water to it, it's all the way up to the max. We have it uh, full drips. Now if I start putting water down, if I can put on different certain places of the lamp, let's see what happens. And now just my lamp is the only thing that's really rearranging in shape. And again, remember, this is the top layer. So depending on what I want to do, and then I can even experiment with blend modes too. That will leave for another demo. But depending on how I put the blend modes on, then I can either move my good copy unchanged to the top or lighten up this copy and leave most of the good copy bleed through or whatever I want to do. But then just keep in mind, we're doing this to a photograph. So it's very interesting as to how this can actually warp a photograph out of shape also. And I will just fast dry it there. And then we can even experiment that if I uh, take the, uh, if I take the, that's the effect I'll get if I take the opacity down on that layer. Or if I put the good one on top, then now this, take the opacity down in that one. That is the effect I'll get. We got some hard drips down here and a little bit of everything. It's going to depend on where I want my straight hard edges. If I want the good copy on top or the good copy on the bottom. Uh, if it's on the bottom, then those straight edges will be broken up by the drips. If I put it on top, then I'll have my hard straight edges on top above the drips. And that would be a completely different look. But again, this is just one simple cutout of the lamp. So now if I cut this out over here and had drips coming off of this arch, then what I would do is just erase from the arch down and then make that a separate copy. And if I put water all up in here, it's going to run my cement wall down and I'm going to get drips going down across uh, the, uh, the arch itself. So it depends on how crazy I would want to go with this type of particular picture. Uh, then I could get a pretty interesting look and then also keep in mind I didn't wait very long for any drips to happen because we did this in real time and I didn't bother uh, waiting to and, and then uh, fast forwarding it. So uh, with that in mind There's what we got after I fast dried. It's not gonna move anymore but I could take this down and still keep my straight edges a little bit, but I took it down to some of it is really uh, distorted, but then also remember that I put water over the entire lamp just to show you what will happen. Uh, you could have been a little bit more selective as to where you put the water and what's gonna all change. But the point of this part uh, is just to show you uh, what, what we could actually do with still even a photograph. And then I can also put these back on and then if I put these together and then take this up here with the orange and orange, that would make an interesting little design in a hurry. But with that all said, and that would be it for the photographs. Let's move on to the final chapter 16. Okay, chapter 16, our final chapter. What we're going to do in this one is we're going to actually just use our cloning tool. It's something that could easily be overlooked uh, to repair and place areas that we may not be able to change or touch up with a transparent watercolor layer. And I'll show you what I mean. First, we're going to put down, we'll leave the layer dry. The tilt is off and we are going to put down some light colored layers of paint. And we'll let them work together. And we'll just let this blend out. And we'll just put some blue in it just for the heck of it. 
and then we'll let that work out a little bit. Okay, that looks good there. We'll fast dry it. And let's see if we can make some retouches and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, we got our shape figured out and set up. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to do this just intentionally just to show you. Now we're working with transparent watercolors. Now that's very difficult to make any kind of uh, adjustments, especially if you're dealing with a straight edge. The reason why is if we were working with opaque paints, then we could easily just uh, paint over that white edge and hard edge right here and, and destroy it and redo something all over again and feather it into what's there. It will be covering 100%. But with transparent watercolors, that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge. I'll show you why. If I turn on this layer here, this red, you could easily see red coming through all of these areas of paint, even the blue, anywhere and what that is telling me that that entire layer is very transparent so with that in mind we would have a very hard time trying to paint over uh, these hard edges right here of white where it meets the color now technically the white is just a paper but then the color stops there if we wanted to just say for example take this white shape out compositional sake just to rearrange things whatever we wanted to do that would be very difficult if I try to go into my colors, and I'll just keep undoing, and just say, for example, if I uh, use my Bloom Wet, if I try to take this out, what it's going to do is it's going to just keep on building up paint, but my hard edge is going to still be there. Why? Because I'm working with a transparent layer of color. And so for that reason, if I want to keep what's there to make it look like it's supposed to be there, I can't make a really dark, opaque layer over top of a transparent layer and expect to look like it's going to feather in. If I start with, uh, just say for example, uh, my yellows here, if I start overlapping my yellows, then it's going to get really noticeable that that's pure yellow. And that and what that'll do is that will just actually uh, cover everything to the point where I now have a pure dark yellow, 100% opacity, uh, just about. And what it did is it will uh, take away what subtle blending I already had. And then number two, it's going to start blending in to what uh, colors I already have. Now, if I undo that, we can try that real quick. Blue. Now that's a pure blue. That's going to jump on and keep in mind I'm still only 50% but if I want to cover up that white that's going to be very difficult. Plus I could uh, fast dry it right away but even if I fast dry it this is going to be kind of a sore thumb because it's going to be more than twice the opacity of what I did over here. And I would have to do that to cover up that white spot. Now if I undo that we'll take it back some. Okay, there we go. We're back as far as we can go. Now, even if I use the clone tool, and if I go down and just say, for example, I want to pull this area right here. If I touch down, that is the uh, pixels I'm going to be grabbing. And then if I move it over and start covering this up, it's going to be the same thing. I still can't get rid of that hard edge unless I keep going and going and going. And now all of a sudden, I have a big dark spot again, the same thing. Now what we need to do is if we want to play on a same field advantage, so to speak, or on the same playing field, then I, what I will do is I will get rid of this red layer. And then once you sandwich everything together, if you have multiple layers, sandwich them all together, merge them all. Now everything is on the same, but it is still floating on the paper. So this is going to be the kind of adjustment you can make once your painting is completely done. If I turn off my canvas, then there's my color, but my all of my layers are merged together, but they're still floating above my paper. So what I want to do then is I saved it as a JPEG, which would sandwich everything together. And let's bring that up now. We will go to... I don't want to save it. 
There it is right there, the JPEG. I'll open it up. And now that it's a JPEG, which would be considered a complete painting, everything is on the same playing field. If I start duplicating pixels over now, then they will be the same value they are when I start moving them around. But the thing is, they will have the ability to cover up anything. And I'll show you what I mean. I will zoom in a little bit. Now, again, say, for example, I want to get rid of this hard edge right here. We would have a hard time doing that in a transparent layer. But now I'm working all on the same layer. But if I turn off the canvas, I am actually uh, on the layer that I want to work. And that is another canvas layer below it. So if I turn off the canvas, now, guess what? I have no more uh, uh, checkered board background that the white paper is a part of the color. So that means everything is sandwiched together. So with that said, if I go to my clone tool now, and I want to, I'll use this cloud glaze, which is a real soft edge. And if I put my, hold my alt key down, and just say, for example, I want to start working down here and get this out. If I put my alt key up here and touch down, that's where I'm going to be getting my pixels from. I could put it down a little bit and then I could go down. Now, even if I put the opacity all the way up to 100%, I'm only going to be duplicating exactly what I have. And I could do that. And now if I start going and start feathering this in, I could completely destroy that straight edge and reduplicate these patterns. I could pull them out wherever I want. If I like this up in here, I'll hold my Alt key down, touch right there, and then I could go down in here and start feathering this up in and destroy this hard edge down here. And then if I want more blue, touch right in here and then start destroying this edge. But then what I'm doing is I'm taking the pixels, obviously they're already there and just shifting them around. So now I can make that blue area as big as I want it or go back to the yellow and orange down here. And the trick about this though is I have a couple of other cloning and photography uh, demos there. The trick about this is just be careful not to reduplicate the exact shapes in a couple of different places because then repetitious patterns are very easy to pick up by the human eye. And now you can see I'm feathering it in to still make it look like a wet wash watercolor. But it's all the same opacity that I'm moving around. And if I, there you go. Now if I want, I could fine tune it a little bit. Get rid of that yellow a little bit, go back over it. But then again, now, if I want to really fine tune it, if I take down the opacity a little bit. That would soften it up, make it mo look more like a, a very soft watercolor. And if I even just keep moving around, it's just going to keep dusting in place. Now that hard white edge that we originally started with is completely gone. So this is just a backup plan in case you have a watercolor that you might not be too sure of or you might want maybe even a couple of different versions of it. Once you save it as a JPEG, then you go back in and change things around. As long as you're using a real soft edge brush, all of mine are, again, on the uh, free assets. Uh, you could use any of those, including the shapes that come with them. And then that way you can actually uh, go back in and pull some of these areas out that are really nicely blended. All you'll be doing is shift them around to different places. Well, that is it. <laughs> Approximately three hours. If you lasted this long, congratulations. Uh, I enjoyed putting this one together. I have a lot of thought and a lot of uh, planning behind it of how all the chapters are going to be, what all they included. Uh, I feel this is probably one of the most in-depth demos I've ever done. And for that reason, I thought that Rebel 5 is, my opinion, uh, the best watercolor program out there. Nothing mixes watercolors like Rebel. And with that all said... Uh, if you picked up the program, uh, congratulations, you'll have fun with it. It does an exceptional job with watercolors. And like I always say, until I see you out in the field or at the studio, thanks for watching.